um, on it in the exams. So absolutely crucial that we learn to understand what the counts are about so that we, when we do sit and study come exam time, we are in a position to at least understand what we are studying, which is obviously of utmost importance. Now, I mentioned it yesterday, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, ladies and gents, what we're trying to do today and for the beginning part of tomorrow's lecture is to just to learn how to draft the liquidation and distribution account. So please take notes as I go along if you think you're going to forget certain things. And then the second half of tomorrow's lecture, we'll be going through uh, an exam question together. And we'll be able to put figures to things um, and it also, I assume it will clarify a lot of questions then as well when we start putting figures to things tomorrow evening. Again, ladies and gents, as per usual this week, I have load shedding here till six-ish. So you might hear the inverter in the background before, uh, sort of up to around six, half past six. Um, apologies for the inconvenience. Right, ladies and gents, let us go to our notes from yesterday that we were working on. Um, they were called the L and D notes. If we can all open that, please, ladies and gents. All right. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Just, just make sure we are all muted. I'm just. All right. One second. Sorry, everyone. Somehow I was joined as a guest and a presenter, so I just had to remove one of them. Um, like I mentioned before that happened, if we can all just uh, go to our notes and start discussing this. So, we look at our l &D notes, ladies and gents. I'm going to go through this together with all of you. Take notes. Um, if I say things that aren't here and you think you might forget it. So, what we're going to... We said our primary focus today is learning how to draft the liquidation account as well as the estate duty account. Because we said the liquidation account is the longest account. And there's a couple of things we have to learn there. Um, and the estate duty account is most definitely the most difficult account. So those two ones we want to learn how to draft this evening. So we are going to start off with the liquidation account. And you'll see on the first page, I have tips with the liquidation account. I am going to read this with you and then I'm going to explain what the tips mean. Obviously, as we start looking through the liquidation account and how we go about drafting it, uh, the tips will make more and more sense as we go along. So just bear with me. Right. It says here, if you can see the asset, in other words, if it has not been sold for cash and is not cash, 
then it is awarded. If an asset is sold for cash, if an asset is sold is for cash, realized. If an asset is already cash, then it is collected. All right. Now we want to make sense of these three different types of assets. So you're going to see when we look at the liquidation account or in the exam, you're going to get a number of assets that the deceased owned. And we know where do we put our assets? Under assets in the liquidation account. We know we have three different types of assets. Immovables, movables, and claims in favor. Very easy way to remember it. Each asset needs to be described. Right. Now, in essence, you get three different types of assets. You get assets that you can physically see and touch. For example, if I tell you that you have a house or you have a car or you have furniture, um, it doesn't matter. You have a share certificate. Any asset that you can see that is not money, in other words, is collected. Oh, sorry, ladies and gents, is awarded. All right. Any asset, I'm going to say that again, any asset that is not cash is awarded. All right. Then your second and third type of asset refers to cash. But you have two different types of cash assets. You have assets that are sold for cash. And then you have assets that are already cash. Let's differentiate between the two. If I told you that you just have a car in your deceased estate, you would agree that that is a non-cash asset, but it's an asset. So what do I do with non-cash assets? I award it. We've learned this. If I told you that the executor sold that car for cash, you agree that's a non-cash asset that we have now converted into cash. The moment a non-cash asset is sold for cash, we say it is realized. Realized is a fancy term for sold. Sold for cash, in other words. Then the third type of asset we said is collected. What is collected? Collected is money that is already there. We didn't have to sell the asset to receive the cash. Let's think of two examples. Um, the person passes away with 50,000 Rand in their F&B bank account. You agree we have 50,000 Rand cash. It's a cash asset. Did I have to sell anything to get that cash? No, the cash was already there. So we say collected. If there's a policy that pays out into the deceased estate, it's a cash, right? That gets paid out. Did I have to sell anything to get that cash? No, I didn't. So it's collected. So any asset that is already money, we say collected. Any asset that is sold for money, we say realized. Any asset that is awarded, in other words, it is a non-cash asset, we use the term awarded then. All right? Just keep that in the back of your minds for now. We're going to look at examples of that as we go through the liquidation account. The thing that makes the liquidation account so long is that you have to describe each and every asset. That's what makes it lengthy. If you didn't have to describe each and every asset, it is probably one of the more easy accounts to deal with because you literally just got to interpret your exam a question and put the information down in the liquidation account. But there's a couple tricks. These are one of these. Remember with assets, non-cash assets awarded, non-cash assets converted to cash, realized, and any asset that is already cash collected. That's my first tip. I think I have about three tips over here. Second one. When the question says that an asset is worth X amount, but that the asset was sold for X amount, use the sold for price. All right. This is important, ladies and gents. You could get an exam question that says, the deceased person, when they die, they have a vehicle. And the vehicle is worth 150,000 Rand. But the executor sells that vehicle for 160,000 Rand. The question is, when we do our liquidation account, which figure do we put down? Do we put the value of the vehicle for 150K? Or do we put what the vehicle was sold for, for 160K? Ladies and gents, 
you always put the sold for price down. Always. Why do I say that? Because if you wrote 150K down, it means that extra 10K that, that, uh, that the vehicle was sold for, it means you put it in your pocket. You can't put down a figure for something if that's not the true amount that you actually sold it for. So even if I told you your vehicle was valued at 150,000, but you only sold it for 80,000, you can't write there in your, under your assets that you have a vehicle for 150K because that is a lie. You only received 80,000 Rand for it when you sold it. So always, if a vehicle is sold, in other words, realized, don't put down the value of the vehicle. Always use the sold for price. Very, very important. And I want to elaborate on this as well. Now, yesterday we learned that Income and losses after date of death falls under the income and expenditure account. And I said to you that the thing to look out for there is money in bank accounts or possibly rental income. Now, I don't want you to get confused. You may get a question that says, when the deceased died, he had a vehicle valued at 150K. Afterwards, the executor sells the vehicle for 160K. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot say that the extra 10,000 Rand is income after date of death. No, because what did we learn? It's money made and money lost after date of death that you can put in your income and expenditure account, like bank accounts, for example. However, the day that person died, they already had that vehicle. You agree the vehicle is an asset. It's not income. It's an asset. Even if the executor sells this vehicle after date of death of the deceased, then obviously if they say the executor sold the vehicle, it is obviously after date of death of the deceased. Do not treat that money as income and expenditure. Keep in mind that the deceased owned that vehicle the day they died. So whatever the executor sells the vehicle for, it is not money made after date of death. Why? Because the deceased had that vehicle the day he or she died already, obviously. So there's the tip. If an asset is sold, always use the sold for price, and that sold for price comes in the liquidation account. We have one more tip, ladies and gents. Let's read it together. When the question says that you have X amount in the bank upon date of death, and then goes on to say that after date of death, the amount in the bank changes. Ah, we spoke about this yesterday. Then the date of death value is for the liquidation account, and the difference that accumulated after date of death is for the income and expenditure account. Right. Ladies and gents, remember our discussion yesterday, I told you, if the question says you had 50K in your bank account when you died, but X amount of months later, the executor closes that account and now there's 51,000 Rand. You agree that obviously interest accumulated in the amount of 1,000 Rand post date of death. What did we learn about money made or lost from bank accounts after date of death? The money made or lost is for the income and expenditure account. So if I told you you have 50K on date of death and six months later, the executor closes the account and there's now 51,000. How much did you have on date of death? You had 50,000 Rand in your bank account on date of death. So you will put that 50,000 Rand in your liquidation account because that resembles how much money you had the day you died. After date of death, a further 1,000 Rand interest was generated. That 1,000 Rand will come in the income and expenditure account under income. I could go the other way around. I could say you have 50,000 Rand the day you die. Six months later, the executor closes the bank account and there is now 49,000 Rand. Okay. How much did you have the day you died? You had 50,000 Rand. So you put the 50,000 Rand in your liquidation account. However, after date of death, you lost 1,000 Rand, probably through bank charges, right? So that will come under expenditure, that 1,000 Rand, in the income and expenditure account. So 
just to recap on these tips, remember the biggest thing about the liquidation account, I would say the, there's probably four or five things, but I'm highlighting three things from the get-go. The first one is learning how to describe your assets. I'm going to show you that. You can literally go home and study these notes. Study how I describe the assets over here. Okay? But remember, differentiate between your three different types of assets. Non-cash, award it. If it's sold for cash, realize it. If it's already cash, collect it. If you come across an asset that is sold for cash, always use the amount it was sold for in the liquidation account. And lastly, if you come across bank money in bank accounts, and that accounts the amount the amount in the bank account changes after date of death, remember in the liquidation account, you put down the amount that was in the bank on date of death. The amount that it increased by or decreased by post date of death is for the income and expenditure accounts. Remember that, ladies and gents, these tips go a long way in assisting you come exam time. All right. Let's start learning how to draft it and start practicing what we've learned so far. Okay. Go to page two to the liquidation account. Ladies and gents, note how I draft it over here. You will see a description column, an item column, a calculation column, and then a negative and a positive column. Ladies and gents, I told you for your assets, you need to learn how to describe your assets. Obviously, we are going to do that in the description column. You then have an item column. I think I touched on it yesterday when we discussed the recapitulation account. You can see I just keep numbering all of my assets. And there's a reason why we number all of the assets in chronological order. You will see when we get to our recapitulation account. The next account I have is a calculation column. Ladies and gents, this is optional. Um, I put it there in case I need to add or minus things, then you can make use of that column. If you want to show the examiner what you are doing, you can you know, use the calculation column to do that, but it is completely optional. And then I have my minus and positive column. Now let's make sense of it, ladies and gents. In my liquidation account, what am I plussing? I'm plussing my assets, right? From my assets, what get minus? my liabilities and estate duty. Assets minus liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution. That's the key figure we wanted to get. Hey? That's the net value of the deceased estate. So where am I going to put all my assets? I'm going to put it in the positive column. Where, where am I going to put my liabilities and estate duty? I'm going to put it in the negative column because I'm minusing that from my assets to get my net value. Okay. Now, in the exam, ladies and gents, you're obviously going to have to differentiate whether the asset is non-cash or cash. So we don't have an exam question here. We're just learning how to draft the l &D. So please keep in mind that what I'm doing here is purely fabricated. If you see I am awarding something, it doesn't mean that it's always awarded. If you see am I realizing something, it doesn't mean that, I'm always re that you always better realize it. You have to identify if it's a non-cash or cash asset. So I'm just purely fabricating this, ladies and gents, just for illustration purposes, right? We know by assets, the first type of asset is immovable property. Now, ladies and gents, in the exam, they might tell you the deceased has an immovable property, has a house, Earth 678, and it is valued at 2 million rand for argument's sake, right? So you're going to put there Earth 678, this is your first asset. And by the positive column where I made the X, you're obviously going to put your 2 million rand. Okay. They might not give you any more information than that. The thing is with these exams, they want you to make up information where information is missing. And the only way you're going to know how to make up information is if you study how to describe all of these assets. Ladies and gents, I've made it easy for you and I've done it already. Okay, but let's understand the concept. You don't have to follow the way I described it, but the key things must be there. When it comes to immovable property, how do you describe immovable property? Earth number, province, title deed number, and size. That is how you describe immovable property. Not just um, 
in the, in the L&D account, but in a contract, in any aspect of law. That's how you describe your real property. So if they just gave you Earth 678, you would have to make up what province it is, you'd have to make up a title deed number for the property, and you'd have to make up what size the property is. We measure size in square meters, hey? If it was a farm, you would measure size in hectares. So that's study work. Study how to describe immovable property. Right. Now, for fabrication purposes, if I told you the, you have a house valued at 2 million rand, would you agree with me that that is a non-cash asset? I have a house. Yes, it's valued at 2 million, but I don't have 2 million rand cash in my hand. All right. It's a non-cash asset. So we must think, all right, so that house must be awarded. Again, we're fabricating this. Okay. But now the problem is, when an asset is awarded, what are you actually telling, uh, well, telling, the, telling everyone? You are telling everyone it's not cash, right? So the question is going to be asked, if you don't have 2 million rand cash, how do you know that that asset is valued at 2 million rand? Does it make sense? If we put a figure down to next to a non-cash asset, the question is always going to be, how do you know that that asset is worth that amount? Who says that house is worth 2 million? That's going to be the question. So you can see what I've done here. Underneath describing it, I said valued by ABC estate agents. I made up who valued it. So you need to learn every non-cash asset, you need to indicate who valued this non-cash asset? Because the question is going to be asked, how did you get to that 2 million with the X's? Well, ABC estate agents valued the property at 2 million. Okay, you, don't, you know, make it up. Make up an estate agency. You can say per appraised value, per municipal value, per whatever. But you need to indicate how you got to value that non-cash asset. And then lastly, you're going to award it, award it to... Now, ladies and gents, you can see I put a question mark over there. This is where I want you to, to listen carefully um, because this is very, very important and make your notes. So may, may I please interrupt? Who are you going to award your non-cash assets? May, may, may I please interrupt a, a bit, sir? I'm actually lost. I don't know which, where we are. We're using the notes that you gave us or we are using uh, the module that we are, we are on it. The same notes we're working from yesterday, the l &D notes, my handwritten notes that started off with tips with the liquidation account. We are currently on page two of that. Oh, okay. Cool. Right. Okay. So you see, we say awarded to. Now, I've put a question mark there because I can't tell you who it is awarded to. It depends on your exam question. Let's, let's make a couple scenarios up. Let's say the exam question told you that you died with a will and you have two heirs to your estate and that's your two children, A and B. Do you agree that A and B must then receive the house because they're your only two heirs, right? So who would you award it to? Half to A and half to B. Let's say you let's spice it up let's say you were married in community of property and you have a will and the will said that you have two heirs a and b and that's it now if you look at the will the will says a and b must receive everything but if i told you that the deceased was married in community of property do you agree that the spouse must get half of everything that's obvious we said marriage comes first so how would you have awarded that house you would have had to have given half to the spouse because of the marriage and community of property. And the other half, you would have to give to A and B for argument's sake. If I told you that the person passed away intestate and they left behind a spouse and three kids, what does intestate law say? It says give everything to the spouse and kids. So you would have to give the house to your spouse and kids. If I told you they died intestate and they leave behind their parents, there is no spouse and kids. You agree, rule two says, give half to the father, half to the mother. So you have to interpret the question. 
every time you award something, it means you give it away to who's supposed to receive it. Now, what do we look at? We look at whether or not the person was married, because if they were in community of property, their spouse must get half of it. Then you look at what the will says. Who does the will say must receive this house? If they died intestate, you look at intestate law and see what does intestate law say? Who is next in line to receive this house? That is why you put, I put a question mark there because it depends on the exam question. You have to look at your exam question and see who is entitled to this property. Non-cash assets take the longest and are the most difficult or most difficult. Well, I wouldn't say most difficult. Just it takes long. Because once you have it, you have it to actually write down. Because look what you have to do with non-cash assets. You have to describe it. You have to say who valued it. And then you have to award it. You have to look at your exam question. Who, who must receive this house, in other words? The nice thing is, every single time you award something, you are going to copy and paste. If you gave the house half to the spouse because of the marriage and the other half to the two heirs, A and B, if I told you you have a car, are you not going to do the same? Half to the spouse, the other half to the two heirs, A and B. If I told you you had furniture, are you not going to do the same? Half to the spouse, half to the two heirs, A and B. So you keep repeating yourself. You'll see there's a lot of repetition that, ha that happens. So the longer we go along, the more and more you'll catch the flow of things. When it comes to cash assets, you're going to see now now. Cash assets are much more easier. The reason is we don't give, we don't award any cash to anyone. Because remember what we learned. Keep your cash because we have to later on see if it's enough cash to pay off all our creditors. Hey, remember we looked at the recapitulation account yesterday. So non-cash assets we award. We give it away. But cash assets we do not give to anyone because we're going to use that cash later on to pay our liabilities and any cash legacies and estate duty and, and, and. Ladies and gents, you are going to get a movable property in the exam. Please study what I've given you over here. Um, you, you would have already had two or three marks at this stage in the back just by doing that. We said the next type of asset is movable property. So let's look at some examples of movables. You are bound to get a vehicle. Maybe they tell you the deceased owns a BMW X3 valued at 200,000 Rand. Okay. So you're going to write there BMW X3. You can see it's my second asset. And I'm going to put the 200,000 Rand in the positive column there where I put the X. Nice and easy. There's your mark. Now, they told us we have a BMW X3 valued at 200K. Let's think to ourselves, ladies and gents, is this a cash asset or non-cash asset? It is a non-cash asset. So what do we have to do with non-cash assets? Describe it. Say who valued it, then award it. Now think to yourselves, ladies and gents, how would you describe a vehicle? Vehicles are described by registration numbers. That's how we describe vehicles in law, ladies and gents. You need to make up a registration number for the vehicle. You can see there, I have made up a registration number for the vehicle. If they don't give it to you in the exam, remember what we learned? Make it up. That's why we've got to understand the basics of how to describe assets. Once you've described it, you need to say who valued it. Remember, non-cash assets must be valued by someone. So I make it up. I say they're valued by BMW Motors. Award it. Give it away. You're going to award it the same way you gave the house away, depending on your exam question. It doesn't change. It's the same thing over and over. Look at the next one, next asset on the next page, furniture. They might tell you the deceased has furniture valued at 100,000 Rand. Furniture is very easy, ladies and gents. How do you describe furniture? All you have to do is say, household furniture and effects. You do not have to list um, what it comprises of. You don't have to say TV, kitchen room, dining room table, lounge, beds. You don't have to say that. You put furniture all under one heading. You just say household furniture and effects. That's it. It's my third asset and I would have put the 100K there where my X is in the positive column. Again, furniture is a non-cash asset. 
So what do we have to do after we've described it? We have to value it and award it. So I value it. You can see what I've written here. I've written here per informal valuation. Now, the thing about informal valuation and why I've written that is I'm trying to make it as realistic as possible for all of you. In reality, we don't, how can I put it? It is very difficult to actually value furniture. The reason why I say that is furniture usually has a sentimental value. And where are you going to sell your furniture? You're going to take it where? You're going to take it to a cash crusaders or you're going to auction it off. You have no idea what, what you're going to get for it. Usually furniture is picked up for big bargains. So in reality, usually furniture is sort of guessed as to what it is valued at. Um, it's very difficult to get it, uh, an exact correct amount for what that furniture is actually valued at. Um, so I wrote there per informal valuation. And what is what that is actually telling the marker of the exam is that you understand that furniture is not really an accurate amount of how much it's valued at. It's more of a calculated guess to what it is valued at. So you can make up that whatever company valued your furniture, but in real life, it's usually done informally. Right. Then again, ladies and gents, you will award it because it is a non-cash asset. Now, please keep in mind, ladies and gents, in the exam, if you look at the vehicle, our second asset, I've structured it as a non-cash asset. But please understand that in the exam, they could have told you that that vehicle was sold for 200,000 Rand. If it was sold for 200,000 Rand, can I award it? No, then it is a cash asset, all right? So just keep those basics in mind. We are fabricating scenarios over here, okay? But whether it's awarded, realized, or collected, depends solely on your exam question. Every question is different. I've just done it in the most likely way that you are going to get it. But it doesn't mean you are going to get it this exact way. Okay, so just make sure we understand the principles. Let's look at my next example I do here. Firearms. Sometimes firearms make their way into the exam. So they might tell you you have a handgun and the handgun is, let's say, valued at 10,000 rand. So what do I write there? I write there firearm, handgun. This is my fourth asset. And I would have put the 10,000 Rand by my X. Do you see, are you starting to catch the drift of, of the easy marks here? Once you've studied how to describe the assets, you are literally copying and pasting your exam question down into your liquidation account. You're copying, pasting your assets down and you're copying, pasting your liabilities down. It, it, it is free marks as we go along. It's just the studying element, you know, that might take some time. Right, so I put the handgun there for 10,000. Ladies and gents, how do you describe a gun? Every gun has a serial number. Okay, so you can see underneath handgun, I wrote serial number and I just made up a serial number. Learn that. Firearms are identified by their serial number if you did not know that. Okay, again, if I told you we have a firearm valued at 10K, is it a cash asset or a non-cash asset? It is non-cash. Hey? It's not money. It's a gun. So we have to value it and award it. Look there. I say valued by Cham Sports. I completely make that up. I don't even know that Cham Sports exists. I just made it up. I'm just showing the marker. I know this gun needs to be valued. All right? And then I award it. The same way I awarded all of the other non-cash assets. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. Let's look at the next example. Okay, Yara, I've mixed it up a little bit. So... You could perhaps get in the exam a question that says you have Kruger Rands, the deceased had Kruger Rands for argument's sake. Coins, I mean, coins can be Kruger Rands. I mean, a coin could also be a Bitcoin, right? It could be any, it could be Ethereum. It could be any type of coin that's worth X amount of money. If you have a look at this one, I've structured this example that the exam question maybe says those coins were sold for cash. Now, if I told you you had Kruger Rands that was sold for cash for, let's say, how much? Let's say 30,000 Rand for argument's sake. I'd write the coins, Kruger Rands. It's my fifth asset, and I'll put the 30,000 Rand in the positive column. Now, again, ladies and gents, we are fabricating scenarios as we go along because I'm just trying to show you the different ways the questions could come. I am now telling you that the exam question is saying, for argument's sake, that the coins were sold for 30k. 
All right. So let's describe the coin. When it comes to coins, the how, what's the way you describe it? You only need to mention the type of coin it is. So if it, they told you it's Krugerrands, just write their Krugerrands. That's a good enough description. If they told you it's Bitcoin, just write their Bitcoin. That's a good enough description. Now we learned after you describe the asset, if it was a non-cash asset, you'd have to value it and award it. But what did we learn with cash assets? If I've sold it for 30K, what do I say? I say realized because the question says I sold the coins for X amount. Then you say realized. Do you see I don't value it? Why don't I value it? Because it's money already. I only value non-cash assets. If the asset was sold for cash, I simply describe the asset, I put down how much it was sold for, and I write realized. Done and dusted. Nothing more to it. Remember I told you a bit earlier, non-cash assets take long to, do, to sort out, but cash assets are simple. Just describe it and just say realized if the asset was sold for cash. I told you also that yesterday that shares in a company also forms under the heading um, movable property. And I do believe you are going to get a company. Good chance in the exam you get a company. Probably a private company. That's the most common type of question that comes around. We know if we get a company, um, it falls under movable property. So let's make a situation up. Let's say that the company says we have shares in ABC company, 50 shares in the company. And the shares are sold for half a million rand, for argument's sake. All right, that's all they tell us. So I write there, ABC company, PTY Limited. They told us it was a private company. That's my sixth asset. And where the X is, I'll put down the half a million. How do you describe a company? Very simple. You indicate how much shares you have in the company and you put down a company registration number. Ladies and gents, how do we describe humans? By their identity numbers. How do we describe companies? By the company registration number. So yes, it is study work to learn how to describe these assets, but I think it's also common sense. Um, once you've read through it once, you should remember how to describe it. It's really not intense study work this. Say how many shares you have in it. If the question doesn't tell you how many shares you have in the company, make it up. Just make it up. All right? Put down the company registration number. Now, remember I told you there's about five things we've got to learn from assets that are tricky. We learned the first three things on page one, where we learned how to describe the assets. We learned, secondly, that if assets are sold, always use the sold for price. And thirdly, we learned money in a bank account. The amount you have on date of death is for the liquidation account. If that amount increases or decreases after date of death, that increase or decreases for the income and expenditure account. Now, there's two more things that we really have to learn here. This is the fourth one that I want to show you. And this is just one note that you have to make. We've learned the principle that if it's a non-cash asset, you must describe value and award. If it's a cash asset, you need to Describe and then just say realized or collected, depending what type of cash asset it is. Companies are the exception to the rule. I want you to make a note. It does not matter if your shares are cash or non-cash. You always have to value the shares. Make the note that even if the shares were sold. So even if it's a cash asset, you still have to value it. We've learned, remember, that the moment you have a cash asset, when you describe the asset, you don't need to value it. We only value non-cash assets. Companies are the exception. You always need to value companies. Okay? And there's certain wording we need to learn, and I've written it out for you. Now, remember my example I gave you now. now. I said we have 50 shares in ABC company, and the shares are sold for half a million rand. So we wrote the ABC company, sixth asset, half a million, 50 shares, and we gave the registration number. According to what we have learned, what should we have done now? We should have just said, realized, hey, because the assets were sold for cash. But companies are the exception. Look what I've written here. Per auditor's valuation, 
approved by Chief Revenue Inspector. Ladies and gents, it does not matter if your shares were sold or not. You always have to say that with a private company. That is study work. When you're done describing a company, please always remember to say, per auditor's valuation, approved by Chief Revenue Inspector, it is worth a mark. It is worth a mark, ladies and gents. Remember the rule, the fourth rule we've learned? Companies are the exception. When describing them, you always have to value it. Doesn't matter if it's a cash asset or not. Then you can see afterwards I've said, realize. Why did I say realize? Because we're going off the assumption that the, our shares were sold for cash. But obviously it's not to say. I mean, the, the exam question maybe does not say our shares were sold for cash. If our shares were not sold for cash, then what would we have done? We would have awarded it, right? Okay, let's look at the next example of a company. I think I also put a public company here. The next page, our seventh asset, DEF company. Now let's make another scenario. The question says we have shares in a public company, DEF company, and the shares are valued at 300,000 Rand. Fogs for given sake. I write there DEF company, LTD, it's my seventh asset, and I'll write my 300,000 Rand there in the positive column where my X is. Ladies and gents, we've already learned how to describe public companies or how to describe any company. Say how many shares you have and then indicate the company registration number. You can see I write the shares in the company and I put the company registration number. Make it up. Right. Again, remember the exception to the rule. You always have to value it. Public companies are a lot easier. All you have to do there is say per stock broker's valuation. That is it. You just say per stock broker's valuation. Then you can see I've awarded it. Why did I award this one? Because I'm running off the fabricated scenario that the question just said, we have shares in DEF company to the value of 300,000 Rand. Obviously, if the question said those shares were sold for 300,000 Rand, then I wouldn't have said awarded to. I would have just said realized. I think we're starting to catch the flow, right? That's typical examples of movables that you could get in the exam. We said there's one other type of asset, and it's called claims in favor. Now, ladies and gents, remember this tip I think I said to you yesterday already. Generally, money, things that are cash, come under the heading claims in favor. The two examples I gave you is money in a bank account and policies that pay out. Now, I want us to think logically. This is cash. So in our brain, you only have two different types of cash. You have cash that is realized and you have cash that is collected. What is realized? We've learned realized is when a non-cash asset is sold for cash. All right. And we've looked at a couple examples of those under our movables. What did we say is collected? Collected is cash assets that are already cash. We didn't have to sell anything to make that cash. What are examples of assets that are already cash? Money in bank accounts and policies that pay out into the deceased estate. All right. So think to yourself, claims in favor, that's where you're going to put your bank accounts and any policies. That's an easy way to remember it. All assets you put under claims in favor is always collected. It's cash assets. And it's cash that hasn't been sold. It's cash from the get-go. Okay? That's, if you want to study it that way, it's an easy way to study it. Now, let's look at the two examples. Or I think there's three assets I've put down here. Yeah. Let's make a situation up. Let's say they tell us um, we have... 5,000 Rand in our APSA check account the day we die. Okay. Now, obviously, that's an asset. It's 5,000 Rand. We know it's money. We know money in bank accounts fall under the heading claims in favor. Hey? Right? Remember to study what is movables and study what is claims in favor. Hey, that's also important. But I'm making it easier for you. Claims in favor is bank accounts and life policies. Okay. So, how will I go about putting down this 5K in my APSA check account? You can see I write the APSA bank. It's my eighth asset. And I'll put the 5K by the X. I write check account. 
How do we describe bank accounts, ladies and gents? Say what type of account it is and make up an account number. We should know this. If I asked you to describe a bank account now without looking at it, the first thing that would come to mind probably as well, probably my account number and the type of account it is, is obviously crucial, right? Look what I've said after I've described it. Remember, it's a cash asset, so I don't need to value it. I don't need to award it. This is money already. We had 5K already in the bank account. So I just say, collect it. Nice and easy. Okay. Now we're coming to our fifth and final thing that I told you we need to speak about and learn. The trick. Now, ladies and gents, I want to speak life policies because it is going to come in the exam. And I want you all to take notes. Very, very important. This is probably the most complicated part of the liquidation account. But, you know, once you have it, you have it and it becomes the easiest thing on earth. <clears throat> I want to talk life policies. Now, let's, let's talk as lay, as lay persons for a second. What is the idea behind you taking out a life policy? The idea is if Carl Kitzman takes out a life policy that says his child, if Carl dies, his child must get a million rand. I've taken out a life policy. What's going to happen when I die? Do you agree the million rand is going to be paid to my child? The whole point of a life policy is when I die, pay X amount of money to my, to my appointed beneficiary. I think we all understand that concept. That's basic. That, that is what a life policy is. Okay. So... The natural thing for a life policy is actually to be treated like a pension fund or retirement annuity. Do you agree if I take out a life policy and I die, I cannot put that life policy as an asset in my liquidation account because does that money ever come into my deceased estate? No. The money gets paid to my appointed beneficiary. Just like we spoke about yesterday and the day before with pension funds. You nominate a beneficiary. When you die, does that money come into your deceased estate? No, it gets paid over to your nominated beneficiary. The same with a life policy. The general rule and norm is that life policies don't come into your liquidation account. Why? Because when you take out a life policy, when you die, that money gets paid to your appointed beneficiary. It does not have a home in your assets. It's not your asset. It gets paid to someone else. But I told you, that writing this exam is like doing a driver's license. They're going to try and create rare situations where life policies can be paid out into a deceased estate. So I want us to distinguish between three different types of life policies. Let's start with the first basic one. A life policy that the deceased takes out that has a nominated beneficiary. So the first life policy is when the deceased took out a life policy over their life and this life policy has a nominated beneficiary. What is going to happen when the deceased dies, ladies and gents? The policy is going to pay out to the appointed beneficiary. So can I include that life policy in the deceased estate? No, I cannot. So if you see a life policy that has a nominated beneficiary, leave it alone, ladies and gents. A life policy over the deceased life that has a nominated beneficiary, I'm saying it again, leave it alone. It does not have a home in the liquidation account. That is the first type of life policy I want to discuss. That is the normal life policy that we all understand. Okay. Now I want to give you a second scenario. Again, a life policy over the life of the deceased. But now the exam question tells you that there is no nominated beneficiary. Now you might think to yourself, how can that be possible? Surely if you take out a life policy, there is a nominated beneficiary. That's the point of a life policy. But it may happen for argument's sake that you appoint someone as the nominated beneficiary. Let's say I appoint X as my beneficiary. What happens if X dies? That's a problem, eh? Because X is only supposed to receive the money when I die. So what do I need to do? In reality, 
I need to go and choose another beneficiary, right? Now, what happens if I die and I have not went and appointed a new beneficiary yet? When I die, they look at my life policy and they're like, right, we see X was the appointed beneficiary. But oh goodness, X has passed away a long time already. So there's no appointed beneficiary anymore. In other words, there is no beneficiary. In the exam, they'll structure it as the deceased has a life policy, but there's no beneficiary. There's no one to claim that money. Think logically. What's going to happen with that money? That money will have to pay out into the deceased estate and then be divided amongst the heirs of the estate. There's no other place for it to go. So the moment there's a beneficiary, you leave it because it's being paid to that beneficiary. It's not part of the deceased estate. But the moment you see there's no beneficiary, then you include it in the liquidation account. Now, ladies and gents, have a look at my ninth asset. Let's say the question said, there's a Sunlam life policy over the life of the deceased um, that must pay out a million rand, but there is no beneficiary. Now we think to ourselves, okay, there's no beneficiary. Now we need to include it in the liquidation account. So I write this on my life policy, my ninth asset, and I put down the million rand by the positive. It's an asset of the deceased estate now. Why is it an asset? Because there was no beneficiary, no one to pay the money out to. How do you describe a policy, ladies and gents? Make up a policy number. Obviously, I think this is second nature to us. We know how do you identify policies with a policy number, right? Now, you're done describing it. But look what I write there. I write no beneficiary. Now, let me explain why I do this. It is not natural for life policies to pay out into the deceased estate. And I've explained to you why already. So if you do someone's liquidation account and you're putting in policies there, remember step five, your L&D must lie open for inspection for 21 days. We learned this yesterday. A lot of people are going to raise objections and they're going to ask, why are you including a life policy over the deceased life in the liquidation account? They're going to say it has no place over there because that money must be paid out to the beneficiary. So why do I go and write no beneficiary there? It's to explain to everyone from the get-go, to avoid objections, to avoid unnecessary admin. I write there no beneficiary so that everyone knows why am I including this policy in the liquidation account. As a point of reference, every time I include a policy in a liquidation account, I give a short explanation why. Because it is not natural to do so. So by writing no beneficiary there, then everyone knows, okay, there was no one to receive the life policy. Um, that's why we're including it into the deceased estate. So it, it's just the ethically right thing to do, if I can put it that way. And then you can see I write collected. Again, it's cash, right? Did I have to sell anything to receive that cash? No, I didn't. So I just write collected. Then we have a third type of life policy. And again, ladies and gents, I want us to listen very carefully here. The first two are quite easy. That was life policies over the deceased life. If there's a beneficiary, don't touch it. If there's no beneficiary, include it. But in both those first two examples, I was referring to life policies over the life of the deceased. I want to mix it up a little bit and give you a third scenario. What about life policies over the life of someone else where the deceased was the beneficiary? Okay, do you hear what I'm saying? No longer life policies over the deceased life. I'm saying the deceased was the beneficiary to a life policy. So X took out a life policy that said, when X dies, the deceased must receive 5 million rand for argument's sake. Okay. <coughs> so let's say, obviously, the deceased dies before X. You agree that there's a problem now because the deceased was supposed to receive that money from the life policy when X dies, right? When X dies, that 5 million would have paid to the deceased, and that we call the maturity value of the policy. Maturity value means the person over whose life the life policy was taken, 
they have died. And the maturity value is now paid over to the beneficiary. So when X died, the deceased would have received the 5 million rand as the beneficiary to the life policy. So you see, we're switching it up. We're now the beneficiary, no longer the policy holder. Now, what would happen normally in life? If the deceased died first, what would X went have done? X went, would have went and chosen a new beneficiary and the policy would have continued. So there would have been no payout into the deceased estate. Why? Because the deceased only qualifies to receive that money once X dies. But we've now got an unfortunate situation. We have died first. So usually X would just change beneficiaries. Nothing would happen, nothing would be affected. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. But again, I told you in the exam, they're gonna try and mix things up, eh? So what happens in the very rare scenario where the deceased now dies, X looks at the scenario and says, you know what? I don't want to continue this life policy anymore. I, there's no other person that I want to appoint as a beneficiary. Literally, that deceased person is the only person I wanted to receive money if I die. So I am going to cancel this life policy now. Let's say that is X's decision. Because you have died, the deceased has died. X decides to cancel the life policy. There's no one else they want to nominate in that person's place. So the policy can continue. In that rare event that something like that happens, what happens is the policy will pay out what we call a surrender value. I'll say it again. The policy will pay out what we call a surrender value into the deceased estate. In other words, into the estate of the beneficiary, the deceased estate of the beneficiary. Now, how do I identify this type of question in the exam? Remember this scenario. This is different from the first two. Look for a scenario where the life policy is over someone else's life. It's not over the deceased's life. But the deceased is the beneficiary. Then look for the words surrender value. If you see the word surrender value, what it is actually telling you is that this is a life policy over someone else's life. The deceased was the beneficiary. The deceased happened to die first. And then the policy holder decided to cancel the policy because there's no one else that wanted to replace the deceased with. So the policy then pays out a certain amount, which we call a surrender value, into the deceased estate. If something like that happens, obviously, if a surrender value is being paid out to the deceased estate, it's usually considerably lower than the maturity value, obviously. I mean, if the maturity value was going to be 5 million, if X died, I would have got 5 million. But if I die first and they cancel the policy, maybe the surrender value might be like 50,000. It'll be a low amount, but it's still an amount. That amount will pay out into the deceased, deceased estate. So what happens if it pays out into my state? It's obviously an asset. Now, how do I go about it, uh, putting this asset down? Look at my 10th and final asset. Let's say the question is there's a liberty life policy over the life of John. The deceased is the beneficiary. However, the liberty life policy pays out a surrender value of 50,000 Rand into the deceased estate. Now we know. Okay, we have to include it because there's money being paid into the deceased estate. I write your liberty life policy. Asset 10, I put the 50,000 rand down there. Again, ladies and gents, we describe a policy with a policy number. Look what I write there. I write surrender value. What am I telling everyone? I'm telling everyone we were the beneficiary. We died first and the policy holder decided to cancel the policy. So the policy paid a surrender value into the deceased estate. Again, remember what I said? Use certain words to explain to your audience why you're including this policy because it's not natural then i said collect it so remember this i'm just going to repeat this one more time to make sure we have it if there's a life policy over the deceased life there's one of two options there's either a beneficiary if there's a beneficiary leave it it's not the deceased asset the money will pay out to the beneficiary when the deceased dies if there's no beneficiary then it means there's nowhere for the money to go, right? 
So they will pay, the policy will be will pay out into the deceased estate because there's nowhere else for it to go. And then the heirs of the estate will share in it. So if the policy is paying out into the deceased estate, obviously we must include it as an asset. The third and final scenario is now different. We are no longer, the, the life policy is no longer over the deceased life. It's a life policy over someone else's life. The deceased, however, was the beneficiary. And when the deceased unfortunately died first, the policyholder decided to cancel the policy. And then the policy pays the surrender value into the deceased estate. Because it's being paid into the deceased estate, we must include it as an asset. Ladies and gents, I told you five things. Obviously, you've got to study this. But those three tips on the first page, the fourth thing was the exception to the rule with companies. And the fifth thing was these three different types of policies. Please, I hope you've taken your notes. It's important. This is going to come in the exam. This is typically what you can look for under assets. Now, you might look at it and say, sure, that's a lot. But actually, ladies and gents, this is free marks. Because once you've learned your five tips, and you've learned how to describe each asset, then you're literally just copy-pasting everything down. I mean, if I look at these 10 assets, so far, I would say we would have made at least 12 or 13 marks. And I, and I mean, I'm talking an exam out of 50. If this was an exam out of 100, you would have probably made about 25% of your exam already, just by listing all these assets. There's really a lot of marks to be made in the liquidation account, ladies and gents. Outside of remembering the rules for policies and remembering where the assets fall and how to describe the assets, it's literally a copy paste from the exam question. The exam will tell you, you have furniture valued at so much, put it down. You have a house valued at so much, put it down. You sold your coins for so much, put it down. Catch the flow. You see how we pretty much did the same thing over and over. Just, just to differentiate, it was a non-cash or cash asset, so you know how to describe it. Learn how to describe your assets. Remember the exception to the rule of companies. And then remember policies, the three different types of policies to look out for come exam time. If you remember that, you're going to get full marks for your liquidation account in the exam. Now look what we've done here, ladies and gents. When we're done with all our assets, you can see I then say total assets. I will then obviously add all of my assets up, all 10 of the assets up, and I'll put it over there next to total assets where I put the X. Ladies and gents, another term for total assets is your gross value of the estate. But we know we're trying to figure out the net value. And we know the net value is total assets minus total liabilities minus estate duty. We've now done the first part, which is the longest and the hardest part, figuring out our total assets. From here, the next thing we need to minus is liabilities. So let's have a look what we do by liabilities. You can see I draw a heading, liabilities. If you go to the next page, I start with it. Now, ladies and gents, if you recall our discussion yesterday, I said two different types of liabilities to look out for. Admin expenses and creditors. You will recall, ladies and gents, admin expenses are the natural expenses incurred in winding up a deceased estate. Yeah, I've given you, look under admin expenses. I give you all kinds of examples of admin expenses to look out for. Bank charges, advertisement costs. Remember, bank charges come from the deceased estate uh, bank account we opened in step two. Advertisement costs come from step three and step five. That was the section 29 and section 35 advert that we looked at yesterday. Valuation costs. To put it in perspective, if you look at our assets, Look what assets were awarded. It was asset one was awarded, asset two was awarded, asset three was awarded, asset four was awarded. So asset one to four, as well as asset six was awarded. Now I'll ask you ladies and gents, we obviously put next to each asset a value. Remember it was valued by ABC estate agents, valued by BMW Motors, valued by whoever. Those valuations were not for free. It cost the deceased estate money. That's why we have valuation costs. We had a property, Earth 678. That had to be awarded to someone. So it had to be transferred to someone. So there was going to be transfer costs, conveyancing costs. The executor's fees, ladies and gents, remember as executor, you receive 3.5% 
of the total asset value in the deceased estate. So if we add all 10 assets up, maybe let's say it was 5 million for argument's sake. We as executor take 3.5% of the total assets that you would find on page 4. Bottom of page 4, the total assets. We get 3.5% of that. That's our fee for doing these six steps. Eh? Master gets a cut. You can see I put their postage and petties. Ladies and gents, you can think to yourself, when winding up this deceased estate, you would have had to make copies of things, which means there was paper costs, cartridge costs. You would have had to drive to and from the master's office, so there was petrol costs. You would have had to phone people, um, so there would be telephonic costs. So naturally, in winding up the deceased estate, you are incurring expenses. Those expenses fall under postage and petties. And then I've given you one additional example of admin expense, and I've said commission costs is something to look out for. Let me give you an example. Go to your assets, go to asset number, well, let's take asset number five, for example, the coins. Now, remember, I think we said we sold those coins for like 50K. Now, the exam question could have said, I mean, the coins were valued at 20K, but sold for 30K. We know we don't use the value. We always use the sold for price. Hey, Remember that rule. That was the second tip I gave you. Always use the sold for price. But in reality, who says that I as executor sold those coins? I might have went to a professional and asked them to sell it for me, right? I mean, that sounds pretty logical. Go to someone who deals with selling these Kruger ads. And they'll sell it for us. But do you agree that they would have charged us a fee? They wouldn't have sold it for free. Maybe they said, I'll sell these coins for you, but my cut is 2,000 Rand for argument's sake. All right. So we paid these people to sell these Kruger Rands for us. We got 30K for it. We put the 30K over there. But we have to pay them the commission for selling the coins for us. And let's say the commission is 2,000 Rand. You agree the deceased estate owes 2,000 Rand to these people for selling the coins for us now. Now that falls under admin expenses. Why? Because they say the coins were sold in the process of winding up the deceased estate. So any money that you pay anyone, so any commission that you pay anyone for selling certain assets for you must fall under the heading admin expenses. Because it was done in the process of winding up the deceased estate. Now, in exam purposes, ladies and gents, I do not think that they are going to tell you there's bank charges so much, advertising costs so much, valuation costs so much, poses and petty so much, commission costs so much. I don't think they're going to do that because it's too easy. Then you're just going to list it all and list the amount and you're going to be making free marks the whole way. You see my logic. I think it's too easy of a question. I think they'll just give the admin expenses to you. They'll tell you your administrative expenses is 60,000 Rand for argument's sake. So you can see where I write admin expenses. You see where my X is? Do you note my X is now in the negative column, hey? The middle column. Remember the negative column was the middle column. And why is it here? Because we are on liabilities. We are minusing everything at the moment. Hey? Liabilities get minus. So I don't think they're going to test you on all of this. I could be wrong. But I just think that it's too easy to just copy and paste all that down and, and get free marks for everything. I think they might tell you, for example, your admin expenses are 60,000, and they might ask you to add executor's fees to it. So they want you to calculate 3.5% of the total assets and add that to your admin expenses. I mean, there's probably different kind, various different types of ways they could ask it to you. We'll look tomorrow evening at an example of one where we do the exam question together. Um, but the idea is if you study these different types of admin expenses, just remember what they are. And, uh, you know, I really don't think it's study work. I think just remember any expenses incurred in the winding up of a deceased estate is an admin expense. If you know what an admin expense is, then you will be ready for whatever way they ask it in the exam. I think they'll just give it to you and just say your admin expenses is 60K for argument's sake. And you would literally just write there, admin expenses, 60,000 in the negative column. Done. One mark. But as long as we know what it is, then it doesn't matter how they ask it in the exam. We'll be ready for it. Okay. 
Then we said the second type of liability is creditors. If you scroll down, you'll see the heading creditors. Ladies and gents, this is literally free marks in the exam. Literally, you, you can't get easier marks in this. In the exam, they are going to mention to you who the creditors are. Who does the deceased estate owe money to? Now, remember, we learned yesterday that was step three, hey, the section 29 advert. Anyone who laid that claim within that three month period, they were our creditors. So they're going to tell you who you owe money to and how much. You, there's no fancy way. You don't need to learn how to describe it. There's no valuations. There's no awarding. There's no realizing. There's no collecting. There's nothing. You just mention who we owe money to and how much. So they might say, for example, you owe money to Vodacom. You owe 4K to Vodacom. So write there, Vodacom, 4,000. You owe 6,000 to Edgar. So write there, Edgar's 6,000. You owe 25,000 rand to the municipality. So write there, municipality, 25,000 rand. You still owe 700,000 rand on your FMB bond account. So write there, FMB bond account, 700,000 rand. It is a copy and paste, ladies and gents. They will tell you what your liabilities are. You write it down and you write the amount. There is nothing more to it. Just to maybe talk about things so that I don't want us to be confused in the exam. So, ladies and gents, there's always what we call full disclosure in a liquidation account. So, let's say you have a house and your house is valued at a million rand but you still owe the bank 700,000 rand. Please don't say, well, the house is valued at a mill. Uh, we still owe the bank 700K. Therefore, we have a 300,000 rand asset and you put 300K by your assets. Please don't do that. You always put down the full value of the asset and the full value of the liability. So obviously, if we owed F and B money on the bond account, that would be for our immovable property, our Earth 678, our first asset. If that asset is valued at a mill, you put down the full million rand. If we owe 700K on the bond, under liabilities, we put down the full 700K we owe. You see the million rand asset and the 700K liability writes off from one another, right? A million minus 700K anyways equals 300,000 rand asset, right? But we, we didn't do the sums and, and put down the balance under assets. Put down the full value of the asset and how much we owe on the asset, We'll put the full amount down under liabilities. Just remember that full disclosure at all time frames. Ladies and gents, that's your liabilities. You can see a lot easier, hey? a lot easier than our assets and a lot quicker to deal with. So what do I do now? I add my creditors and my admin expenses up and that will give me my total liabilities. So what does my sum read so far? I have my total asset figure, which we found at the bottom of page four. From that figure, I minus my total liabilities, which I have here on page five. So I have total assets minus total liabilities. We know there is another asset that needs to be minus, which is estate duty. We spoke about this yesterday. That is the money that we owe SARS, hey? But what did we learn yesterday? We do not know how much estate duty we owe. We still need to calculate that. We need to learn how much estate duty um, we owe SARS, right? That was our second account. So what do you do? What, what I recommend is you write estate duty, and then obviously where my X is there, you leave it blank because we don't know how much it is. We still have to calculate it. Underneath it, you write balance available for distribution. Where my X is, you leave it blank because what is balance available for distribution? Total assets minus total liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution but we do not know the estate duty figure yet so our estate duty figure is blank so it means we don't know our balance available for distribution yet so our balance available for distribution is blank as well so we are basically done with the liquidation account we're now going to go and do our estate duty account which is the second account all right when we are done with that account, we'll take that answer and put it back in our liquidation account. Then only can we finalize the liquidation account. All right, ladies and gents, that is the liquidation account. Yes, you're going to need to practice it. Yes, we're going to have to put a real question to it with real figures so we can properly see how it's done. But I want us to start understanding the principles of it. 
Those five tips I gave you, very important. It goes a long way to, to understanding this liquidation account. And look at the flow of things. You know, it was a copy paste of most things. You know, just realizing what assets were awarded, realized or collected, the liabilities were easy enough. I just want us to have that basic understanding of what we're trying to achieve over there. And we know what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve the net value, the balance of distribution. What is left that we can give away in terms of marriage, legacies, and heirs? That's what we're trying to achieve there. But in order to fully achieve it, we have to now go and do our second account, which is the estate duty account, to see if we owe SARS any money. So that is the next thing we're going to learn. And this is going to be the most difficult out of everything. I promise you tomorrow night is a, a hell of a lot easier than tonight. Okay? Ladies and gents, I see it's 10 to 7. Let's take a 10-minute break. I think we need it. And then 7 o'clock, we come back and we start discussing the estate duty account. Thereafter, I'll open the floor for questions as per usual. Right. See you all in 10 minutes.
All right, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Sorry, I just needed an extra two minutes. My voice does tend to take a bit of a beating with things like this. Um, but I'm good to go. Let us move on to the next account. <clears throat> now, I said, ladies and gents, um, you know, the, the next account is the toughest. I'm going to try and simplify things for you and give you an easier way of studying it um, and to understand it. Now, just to put things in context, if you look at your liquidation and distribution account, we said it's five different accounts. The reason why it's just called liquidation and distribution account, because theoretically, the only accounts that are showing you who gets what is just the liquidation and the distribution account. If we think practically about it, what does the liquidation account show you? It shows you how much the creditors get and it shows you how much SARS gets from estate duty. What does the distribution account show you? It shows you how much the spouse gets and how much all the beneficiaries get. So those are the only two accounts with people actually receiving something. I mean, the estate duty account that we're going to look at now, we are not giving anyone anything in this account. We are simply following a formula given to us by SARS to determine how much money the deceased person owes them. And, how, and where do we put that figure? We put it in the liquidation account. So whatever we're going to do in this estate duty account, don't think, why are we giving this one this now? And why is this person getting that now? No one is getting anything in the estate duty account. It's a formula we follow to see if, if this person owes SARS money. Think of the recapitulation account. Are we giving anyone any money over there? No, we are not. We are simply seeing if we have enough money available. So it's just the liquidation and the distribution account that shows who's getting what. So if you're a creditor, you look at the liquidation account. If you're a beneficiary, you look at the distribution account. That's what's called liquidation and distribution account. But there's a number of accounts that comprise it, which is obviously all relevant. I would venture to say the income and expenditure account is also an account that could show who's getting what. And that's only because, like I explained yesterday, if there's excess income, we've also got it distributed in ranking of spouse legatees heirs. Um, but we'll still come to that. But I just want to get that point across so that you know, it just helps us understand the bigger picture. And um, again, just keep in mind what we are going to do now. We are not giving anyone actually anything. We are just following a formula to see if SARS is going to be paid any money. And I think I told all of you yesterday, not everyone owes SARS money when they pass away. You have to be wealthy enough. I think I used those words. And you will see now know why I say so. So let's look at the estate duty account, ladies and gents. That is, what's it, page six. Yeah, page six. All right. So on the top of the page, I just give you the formula um, to make life easy for you. Now, let's just read, let me read the formula, and then I'll explain it to you. The formula says property plus deemed property less, less means minus, okay? In the estate duty account, we don't use the word minus, we say less. Less allowable deductions, less primary rebate of three and a half million, and that's going to give us an answer. That answer we call the dutable amount. 20% of the dutable amount equals estate duty. That will determine if we owe SARS any money. Now, I'm going to tell you straight off the back of it. If you know those first three things, if you know what is property, what is deemed property, and what is allowable deductions, if you know those three things, if you study those three things, you can do estate duty. Because the rest of the question is easy. If you have a look, what comes after we've less allow deductions? It says less primary rebate of three and a half million. That's study work. That is the current rebate in South Africa. And it'll make sense now. now. So property plus deemed property minus allowable deductions minus three and a half million is going to give you an answer. If that answer is negative, it obviously means we don't owe any money. If the answer is positive, then 20% of that answer, so let's say the answer is 100 rand, the dutable amount is 100 rand. 20% of 100 rand is how much? It's 20 rand. Therefore, our estate duty is 20 rand. We owe SARS 20 rand, in other words. But we need to learn what is property and deemed property and allow deductions. If we know what that is, then we can answer estate duty. Now, remember, 
This is SARS calculation or SARS way of calculating whether you owe them any money. It doesn't reflect your true, I mean, if you think of property, what do you think of? You think of your assets, right? But what SARS regards as asset for tax purposes is different to real life. That's what they call a property or deemed property. If you think of what should be minus from your assets, you might think of liabilities. But what SARS regards as an allowable deduction is different. They've got a different perspective. We've got to follow it when calculating our estate duty. Now, why do I say you've got to be wealthy enough? Because think practically. If you take your property figure and you then plus your deemed property figure to that, and you then minus your allowable deduction figure from that, that's going to give you an answer, right? Let's say your property is 2 million. Your deemed property is 1 million. So you agree 2 million plus 1 million is 3 million, right? Let's say your allowable deductions is, how much are we going to make it? Let's say your allowable deductions is 1 million. So we've got to minus a million again now. So 2 million plus 1 million minus 1 million equals 2 million. Make sense? Property is 2 million, allowable deductions is 1 million, so that's 3 million. Uh, uh, your deemed property is 1 million, so that's 3 million. Then it says minus allowable deductions. Let's say your allowable deductions is 1 million as well. So it'll be 3 million minus 1 million. That's now 2 million. Hey? What's the next part of the sum? The next part of the sum says minus 3.5 million. That's standard. That, that rate SARS gives us. That's the current rate. What is 2 million minus 3.5 million? Do you agree it's a negative answer? So your dutable um, amount is a negative answer. It's negative 1.5 million. Now, for estate duty purposes, you don't get a negative. If you get a negative, you just write nil, N-I-L. You don't put a zero, you write the word nil out. What's 20% of nil? It is nil. You see, we don't owe SARS money. But let's say your property is 5 million rand and your deemed property is 2 million rand. You agree 5 million plus 2 million is 7 million. Let's say your allowable deductions is 1 million. So 7 minus 7 million minus the 1 million is now 6 million. Okay. What's the next part of the sum? Minus 3.5 million from that. What is 6 million minus 3.5 million? That's 2.5 million. Okay, so your dutable amount is two and a half million. What is 20% of two and a half million? Well, that's 500,000 Rand. So your estate duty would now be 500,000 Rand, meaning you owe SARS 500,000 Rand. But not most people will get a negative answer because most people's property plus deemed property minus allowable deductions is already less than three and a half million. You know, 95, 90, I would say 98% of people. Now, if it's already less than three and a half million and everyone gets to minus three and a half million on step four by the primary rebate, you are going to always get a negative answer, meaning no, meaning you're going to owe SARS no money. It's only when your property and deemed property is, you know, a lot of millions that it starts to become a tax issue, right? And that's where people would be paying estate duty when you pass away. And I'm sure you've heard of the concept estate planning, right? Now, estate planning is when you plan to try and minimize your tax when you die. You will see as we work through estate duty, you'll start to pick up tips on, on what's bad or what's good for tax purposes. And let's be real, ladies and gents. Let's pose a scenario. You have two kids. You want to leave as much as possible for those two kids. Imagine if SARS, imagine if you have 10 million available, but SARS is taking three of that 10 million. Now your kids is only getting 7 million, but you wanted them to receive 10 million. So how can you structure your estate that SARS doesn't take 3 million, but maybe only takes half a million, you know, to try and maximize things that you pay as, as less tax as possible. And by understanding estate duty, you, you'll figure it out. And I'll explain it to you as we go along. But that's the formula we got to follow. Okay, so we have to learn what is property, what is deemed property, and what is allowable deductions? Once we've learned those things, we can actually do estate duty. So now let's have a look at what we do. Again, ladies and gents, we'll do one with figures tomorrow evening. I'm just teaching you how to draft it this evening. Okay. So look at how I start. 
You notice I only have three columns, ladies and gents. I probably I have my column where I, you know, obviously speak about what is my property, what is my deemed property, what is my allowable deductions. And then I have two other columns. Ladies and gents, as a general rule, your first column is negative, your next column is positive, right? So everything I'm plussing, I'll put in the far right column. Everything I'm minusing, I'll put in the middle column. Same as what we did with the um, liquidation account. You remember the column right at the end was my positive column. The column just to the left of it was my negative column. That's where we minus our liabilities and our estate duty. So everything we're plussing goes in the right column, everything we're minusing in the column next to it on the left. Okay. So we start off with the heading property. We need to learn what is property. Now, let us just think logically. What is property? If you have 20 Rand in the bank, is it your property? Yes, it is. If you own a car, is it your property? Yes, it is. If you own a house, is it your property? Yes, it is. Anything you own, any asset you own is your property. I think that makes perfect sense. So what do I say my property is? It's my total assets. Ladies and gents, where do I get my total assets from? Remember at the bottom of page four, when I was done with my 10 assets, I made a heading and I said total assets and I put the total over there, the bottom of page four. You take that figure and you put it down there in the positive column next to total assets. So your total assets, you take straight from the liquidation account. Remember I told you, you need the accounts to complete one another. So if you didn't do your liquidation account, you wouldn't have known what your total assets were, right? Is it making sense why we had to first do the liquidation account right up till the very end before we could start this estate duty account? Your property is your total assets. Now, ladies and gents, for most people, that is it. You know, in real life, most scenarios, when you do your estate duty account, you write the total assets, you put the figure in and you're done. You're done with property. But again, what did I tell you guys? This is, this is like driving a car. They can oppose all kinds of scenarios. Now, I want, before we go any further, I want us to have this understanding. It must make sense that the more things we are plussing, the worse for us. The more things we are minusing, the better for us. Does it make sense if we keep plussing things, we have a higher likelihood of having to pay tax? What, what, what is good for us? The more things we can minus, the less likelihood we have of paying tax. So you agree, if our total assets was 8 million, and we put down 8 million, we think, sure, this is not a good start. Eh? I mean, ultimately, if your total assets is 8 million, there's a very, very good chance that you're going to pay tax. That's a high amount of total assets. Okay? But SARS is saying, you know what? There's potentially two things you can, we have that can adjust these total assets. Two things that can adjust it. The first thing is if you owned a farm. If you owned a farm, a farming undertaking, I mean, there's a difference between living on a farm and farming. You can live on a farm and not farm. That means nothing. But if you're actually farming on that farm, whether it's cattle, sheep, crops, or any agriculture, it doesn't matter. If you farmed and you owned a farm during the course of your life, SARS is saying, we want to give you a rebate. We don't want to tax you on the full value of your farm. Do you agree that your farm would have already formed part of your total assets? If I told you, you you lived on a farm, where would you have put that farm? Under immovable property in the liquidation account, right? So it already forms part of your total assets. I mean, that's a given. But SARS is saying, if that farm was valued at a million rand, obviously that million rand comprises part of your total assets, which we've already plussed. We don't want to tax you on that full million rand if you lived on a farm. We only want to tax you on 70% of the value of your farm. We'll give you a 30% rebate on the value of your farm. And that's only for people who live on farms, not for people who live in ordinary houses. Now, you might ask, why do people or why do farmers get a 50% rebate? Well, if you're running a farm, what are you actually doing? You are running a business. Now, what happens when you run a business? You pay tax. So they're saying that farmer through their whole life paid tax on the immovable property because everything they farmed with, they had to pay X portion to SARS. So they're saying when you pass away, because you've been paying tax your whole life on that specific farm, we will not tax you on the full value of your farm. 
will help you a little bit, but only obviously once you've passed away now. So it helps your beneficiaries, not you. So we only want to tax you on 70% of the farm. Now, they say minus 30% of the value of the farm. So if you get an exam question and you see a farm, you're thinking, sure, I'm going to make marks. Why are you thinking that? Because in the liquidation account and the immovable property, you're going to describe your farm, value it, award it, and you're going to put down the 1 million rand in the positive column. You've made, let's say, at least two marks there. But you're also going to remember, when I do my estate duty account, from my total assets, 30% of the value of the farm I can minus. I'm going to make an extra mark. So if the farm is valued at a million, what is 30% of a million, ladies and gents? It's 300,000 rand, right? So we can minus that 300,000 rand over there from the total assets. See where it says less 30% of farming undertaking. Do you see how I've put it in the negative column? I've put that X in the negative column because I can minus 30% of the value of the farm from my total assets. We are minusing. It is a good thing, ladies and gents. But if you don't have a farm in the exam, there's nothing you're going to do there. You're going to leave that alone. But if they give you one, remember 30% of the value of the farm, you are not going to be taxed on. So you can minus it from your total assets because obviously the full value of your farm has already been included in your total assets. So that's one thing to look out for. The second thing to look out for, okay, and yeah, you're going to need to make a note. I'll give you 10 seconds to grab a pen and paper if you don't have one with you. I told you guys that I think you're going to get a, um, a private company in the exam. And the reason why I assume you're going to get one, and obviously not for, for definite. I mean, I have no idea what's coming in the board exams. Um, it's just, you know, from past papers and from what I've seen. The reason why I think they're going to give you a private company, and I'm not saying public company, I'm saying private company, a PTY LTD is because they want to test if you know where to place it in the liquidation account, which we've learned comes under movable property, right? And we've learned what you've got to say, uh, approved by chief revenue, per auditor's valuation, approved by chief revenue inspector. We looked at that before we break. But there's also something you need to do with it, possibly in the estate duty account. Now, you can see I've written here, less difference in private company shares. Now, that could be less or plus. It depends. If you're lessing it, you're putting it in the negative column. So that's great. We're minusing it. Great for tax purposes. But if we plus difference in private company shares, it's obviously going to come in the positive column, which is now bad for us. So let me explain. This, and you can make these notes as I say it, this only accounts for private companies, hey? not public companies. And this is where shares in a private company are sold at a different price to what they are valued at. I'm going to say it again. This is where shares in a private company are sold at a different price to what they are valued at. Let's make sense of this. Let's say you get an exam question. And they say you have shares in a private company. Let's just make the figures easy. Let's say the shares are valued at 10 Rand. Okay. But they tell you that the executor sells these shares for 12 Rand. How much did we put down in the liquidation account? Did we put down 10 Rand or 12 Rand? What did we learn? Always use the sold for price. You agree we would have put down 12 Rand hey, in the liquidation account. Okay. But SARS is saying, when it comes to shares in a private company, we don't want to tax you on what you sold your shares for. We want to tax you on the value of your shares. Now, keep that in mind. We want to tax you on the value of your shares, not what you sold your shares for. Now, if I told you the shares were valued at 10 Rand, but we sold it for 12 Rand, we know in the liquidation account, we always put the sold for price. So we would have put 12 Rand. You agree that 12 Rand would now form part of our total assets. But SARS is saying, hold on, we don't want to tax you on that 12 Rand. We only want to tax you on 
10 Rand. So you agree you sold it for two Rand more than what it was valued at. Now, if you're selling shares for more than what it was valued at, you can minus the difference in estate duty. I'm going to say it again. If you sell private company shares for more than what it was valued at, the difference you can minus in estate duty. So if my value was 10 Rand, but I sold it for 12 Rand, you agree I sold it for two Rand more than what it was valued at. So SARS is saying, we've got to minus that two Rand because I only want to tax you on the 10 Rand. So minus the difference, minus that two Rand over there. You agree that's positive for us. We're getting a two Rand rebate. But the opposite can also happen. What happens if I told you these shares were valued at 10 Rand but they were sold for seven rand. How much would we have put in our liquidation account? You agree we would have put seven rand, always the sold for price. So that seven rand would have formed part of our total assets. But Sars is saying, hold on, you've only put seven rand there, but the rule is we're not taxing you on what you sold it for, we're taxing you on what it's valued. So we wanna tax you on 10 rand, even though you only got seven rand for it. So we need to add three rand. So if shares are sold for less than what they are valued at, the difference now needs to be plus. I'm going to say it again. If shares are sold for less than what they are valued at, the difference now needs to be plus. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's, let's make logical sense. Remember, if the shares were sold for more, so as I say, we don't want to tax you on that more. We only want to tax you on what it was valued at. So minus that difference. You can minus it under property, which is great for us. But if the shares were sold for seven Rand and they're valued at 10 Rand, you agree SARS is saying, well, that seven Rand forms part of your total assets, but we want to tax you on 10 Rand, not seven Rand. So the difference of three Rand, we've got an our plus to your property because we want to tax you on 10 Rand, not the seven Rand. So the theoretical way to learn it is if shares are sold for more, Minus the difference, if shares are sold for less, plus the difference. But, you know, again, I've been speaking to you, and I've been saying, I, I want you to understand the logic behind it, not just the theory behind it. And the logic is shares, SARS wants to tax your shares on their value, not what you sold it for. So if you sold it for more, that is why we got to minus the difference because SARS don't want to tax you on that extra money. If you sell it for less, we've got to plus the difference because SARS are saying, hey, we want to catch you on what you valued it for, not what you sold it for. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I think this is coming. You know, this often comes in an exam. And if you get a private company and you see the question is telling you the shares were sold at a different price than what they were valued at, you should be salivating. You should be happy because you know, great, I'm going to make marks in my liquidation account when I put it down under movable assets and I'm going to put down the sold for value. But under total as under property, if it was sold for more, the difference I'm going to minus. If it was sold for less, the difference I'm going to put in the positive column. So it'll go under the same column as total assets then. Right? In my example, yeah, I've said less difference in private company shares. So I made the assumption that the shares were sold for more than what they were valued at. But like I explained to you now, the opposite could also happen. Unlikely in an exam question, but I have seen it before. Um, they could show you, tell you that the shares were sold for less than what they were valued at. Then that difference needs to be plus. Now, again, ladies and gents, a lot of people in life do not own farming undertakings and they do not own shares in a private company. Then what would their property have been? It would have just been their total assets. Done. Finished and clocked. But in the exam, they're going to throw a couple curveballs. So I want you to remember your property is your total assets in the positive column from your liquidation account. Have a look if they have farming undertakings, farming property. 30% of the value of that farm you can minus. Then have a look if they have private company shares. If they have and the shares were sold at a different price to what they were valued at, the difference is either minus or plus, depending if it was sold for more or less than what it was valued at. So in other words, total assets minus 30% of the farming taking, minus or plus, depending on the exam question, the difference in the private company shares, that will give you your property. Do you see underneath there, I draw two lines. 
I'm going to put my property figure in there. What's your property figure? Total assets minus 30% of farming undertaking minus difference in private company shares. That gives me the property. So in essence, we would be hoping in some or other way to try and um, minimize our tax, to try to get our property as low as possible. I mean, ladies and gents, you, you can't hate the fact that you have a lot of money, right? And you have a lot of assets. The reality is the more you have, the more you got to pay. But SARS is saying, well, if you had a farm and you were doing business there, 30% of the value of a farm, you don't need a tax. If you had shares in a private company, um, then uh, hopefully those shares get sold for more than what they were valued at because that difference we could minus, which would be great for estate duty. But if those shares were sold for less than what they were valued at, you know, that's a problem. That's going to hurt us because it means we got less value for our shares when we sold it. Plus the difference we're going to have to plus by estate duty. So we're going to be hit on tax on that as well. It's a problem, but it's the way it works. But in a nutshell, that is what property is. That's how you calculate property for tax purposes. That is not your property in real life, ladies and gents. That's not resembled anywhere else. This is just for tax purposes. SARS is saying this is how we calculate property. Right. From there, the next thing we said we've got to learn is we've got a plus deemed property. So you see I have a heading there, plus deemed property. Now, ladies and gents, I think the name gives it away. Deemed property. Property deemed to be property. That deemed word tells us a whole story. What does it actually tell us? Let's think logically about it. It tells me that this, what you list under here, SARS regards as your property for tax purposes, but in real life, it's not your property. Deemed property hurts people, ladies and gents. This is where people can get hurt for tax purposes because what comes under here, you as the deceased person are being taxed on even though it was never your property when you lived. You hear what I'm saying? Things SARS regards as your property, but we know it's not our property. There's three things to look out for here. I'm going to read the three things that we're going to talk about. Donations, accrual claim received, life policy with named beneficiary. There's These a are the three things we look out for under deemed property. Now, Let's talk about this. What is a donation? Ladies and gentlemen, hand. that is, let's just make sure we muted. I'm getting some background sound from someone. I'm not sure who. There's a hand, sir. That's fine. We're not doing questions at the moment. When we get to questions, everyone will get the opportunity. So okay. when it comes to when it comes to deem property, and we look at the first one, which is donations. Now, ladies and gents, that is any donations that is made into the deceased estate. Now, I gave you an example, I think it was yesterday. Remember when I told you about um, the, that uh, shortfall that I had in the one deceased estate? There was about 140K shortfall and I had to sell the house, but then the two beneficiaries said, hold on, don't sell the house, we'll each pay 70k into the deceased estate. So they paid 140k into the deceased estate to help out, in other words, right? So they made a donation into the deceased estate of 140k so that we had enough cash to pay the shortfall. Now, um, ladies and gents, you agree that that 140k was never the deceased's money, right? The deceased never owned that 140k. The two beneficiaries decided to donate it to the deceased estate so they didn't have to sell the house. However, SARS are saying it doesn't matter. Any donations made in the deceased estate, the deceased person must be taxed on that donation as well. So that 140K that they paid in, we had to plus it under deemed property as if the deceased person owned that 140K when they were alive. You catch my drift. It's, my, it's things you don't actually own. It's not your asset, but SARS taxes you on it anyways. So if you get an exam question, they tell you someone donates 140K for argument's sake into the deceased estate. Um, we know that that donation 
is going to be taxed or does hurt us from an estate duty perspective because it gets plus. You see, we're plus in deemed property. We learn plus is bad. So everything on a deemed property is, ain't great for us at the end of the day. The donations made into the deceased estate is plus over there. The second one I mentioned there was accrual claims. Now, I think the accrual is, is a very unlikely situation, but let's just understand it. Okay, so what does accrual refer to? That refers to a marriage out of community of property with accrual, right? We know you're either completely out or you're with accrual. And the basic idea behind um, being married with the accrual system is that, um, is that during the course of your marriage, you and your spouse are obviously 50-50. What you acquired before your marriage is yours, it's theirs, but during the course of your marriage is 50-50. What a lot of young attorneys don't actually understand about accrual is accrual only kicks in upon termination of marriage through death or divorce. Okay, So accrual kicks in upon termination of marriage. So what does that mean? That means, let's say I'm married to X. And no problems, we're happily married. Today, I make a million rand. My spouse X has no claim to any of that money. The million rand is mine. I can go spend it today. She has no claim to it. Because accrual only kicks in when the marriage terminates. Let's say I die today. You agree the marriage is now terminated because I've died. Now my spouse has an accrual claim. So if I have that million rand, half of it is hers, right? And vice versa at the end of the day. So just keep that in mind if you're going forward. If you're married with a cruel system, it doesn't mean you are in community of property during your marriage. It doesn't mean, hey, what's mine is yours, vice versa. Uh-uh. Remember, you got married out of community of property, right? It's yours, yours, theirs is theirs. The cruel just means if you guys divorce or, or uh, if the marriage terminates, then we do a calculation to see how much you grew and how much you grew during your marriage. And we got to make it 50-50. So if you grew a million and the other one grew 2 million, it means the other one grew a million rand more than you, right? Half of that must be paid to you. So you must get half a million so that you guys are put on an equal footing. That's the idea behind accrual. So if you were married out of community of property with the accrual system, you agree when you die, an actuary would probably need to do a calculation to see during the marriage, how much did the deceased make? And during the marriage, how much did their surviving spouse make? And they'll have to do a calculation because someone is going to owe someone money. That's how it works. Right? Either the deceased estate is going to owe the surviving spouse money, or if the surviving spouse was more wealthier during the marriage, the surviving spouse is going to owe the deceased estate money. That's the reality of a crew. Right? So let's say I die and I'm married in the accrual system. Now they do a calculation and they see, hold on, my surviving spouse owes me money because of the marriage. They owe me a million rand for argument's sake. So that means they grew two million rand more than me. So half of it they must give away. That's the idea behind a crew. So that means my surviving spouse must pay a million rand into my deceased estate because that's what they owe me because of the marriage, right? Now Sars is saying, Yes, Carl, well, you used to lie. Well, you were alive. You did not have that million rand. That was your spouse's. The claim only came alive because you died and the accrual claim kicked in. So you, Carl, did not see that million rand while you were alive. It was never your asset. However, your spouse must pay that money into your deceased estate now because that's the accrual claim. So SARS is saying you must be taxed on it. So any accrual claim the deceased receives from a marriage out of community out of community of property with the crew must be added. So they're saying, I know you didn't have that money, Carl, but your deceased estate is now entitled to that money because of your marriage regime. We need to plus it over there. Okay? Are you starting to catch the drift behind deemed property? Money you didn't have, but you are going to be taxed on it. We'll go to the third and final one now. And this one, I think, is coming in the exam. Ladies and gents, this is life policies over the deceased's life with a named beneficiary. Now, let's go back to what we learned earlier. Remember, we learned the three different types of life policies. Remember the very first one I said, if the deceased person has a life policy over their life and there's a named beneficiary, 
What do we do with it? We said we leave it alone, hey? Eh? Because that, when you die, that money is going to go pay straight out to your name beneficiary. It's not your money. I mean, that's a basic concept. It was never your money. It was a life policy you took out on the basis that when you die, someone else gets money. That's the whole concept. So we never included it in our liquidation account because it wasn't our asset. It was that beneficiary's asset. But SARS is saying, yes, I know you didn't include it in the liquidation account because it wasn't your asset. But for tax purposes, we are going to count it as your asset. So imagine you take out a life policy. You have a kid. And that life policy says when you die, 10 million rand must be paid to your kid. Let's say you only worth 4 million. Your property is 4 million. All of a sudden, your property is not 4 million. For tax purposes, it's 14 million. Because that life policy is being plussed under deemed property for tax purposes. All of a sudden, that doesn't seem very clever. But at the end of the day, you wanted to leave your kid something. But we need to keep in mind, that's going to hurt you for tax reasons. It's, it's unfair on the basis that it was never your life policy. It was never your money. It was over your life, but it was taken to benefit your kid. But SARS is saying, yeah, that 10 million is going to go to your kid. But for tax purposes, we're going to hit your deceased estate with that. You'll see now, now how we can mitigate it. And I'll speak to you like from a practical perspective, what I suggest. But I think that's coming in the exam. And I think it's coming because they want to see life policies with a name beneficiary. They want to see that you leave it alone in your liquidation account. But they also want to see that you understand for tax purposes that it's going to count. And it falls under the heading deemed property. So those Can are you... three different types of deemed property which you need to learn. And I, th I think it's easy enough. I think donations to the deceased estate, I mean, the question will tell you. It will tell you if there's a donation to the deceased estate. We know it's deemed property. If there's an accrual claim from a marriage out of community property with accrual, if the deceased is owed money from the surviving spouse, it falls under deemed property. And if there was a life policy of the deceased life with a named beneficiary, we already learned we don't count it in the liquidation account because it's not our asset. Money's going somewhere else. But for tax purposes, we are going to plus it. Now, that's the second one. Now look at the third and final one that you need to study. Allowable deductions. And ladies and gents, you will obviously be able to look at your notes in your books and stuff and study these things ex extensively. I'm trying to break it down in a manner, especially for those who have never done um, l and before. I'm trying to give you a, a quicker and easier way to study it and trying to focus heavily on things that they like asking in the exams. If you're catching what I'm saying very easily, then it, it will be great to go to your notes, notes and try and extend your knowledge. But if what I'm saying is really difficult, then I would suggest you focus more on these notes that I'm giving you for the l and than trying to go too excessive into the book. That's just a tip. And every, every individual will, will be different in that regard. So we add our deemed property up. And you see I have two lines there, and I'm going to put my figure there. So, so far I have a figure for property, and I have a figure for deemed property. You remember the sum? Property plus deemed property. So my property figure plus my deemed property figure, that's going to obviously add up. Right, But from there, I need to minus two things. The first thing I need to minus is my allowable deductions. Now, ladies and gents, what do we hear? We hear the term minus, less, right? What did I tell you earlier? If we are minusing things, this is great. The more we can minus, the less chance we have of paying tax. Now, there's about five things that I want you to learn that you can minus, right? First thing is, you can minus, is liabilities. Ladies and gents, this is your total liabilities from your liquidation account. So that is on page five. Remember on page five, we had our total liabilities. That was our admin expenses and our creditors. We added it up and it gave us our total liabilities. So you take that figure from your total liabilities and you put it down there under allowable deductions. Copy, paste, put it down, free mark. I don't think there would be negative um, marking, 
So if your total assets or your total liabilities was wrong in the liquidation account, but you correctly brought that wrong, wrong figure correctly into your estate duty account, they won't negative mark you in that fashion and you would still get your marks, just in case you were wondering. Right. So remember, this is all good things we can mine us. You know, but you know, I say good things. I say good things and bad things for tax purposes. Now, for tax purposes, the more your liabilities was, the better, right? Because it's a bigger amount to minus. But when you were living, is a high. I mean, we all strive to not really have debt and not really owe people money. Hey? So while you're living, low liabilities is great. But when you pass away, it's for tax purposes, it's good. It's, it's actually a weird concept. Right. Second allowable deduction to look out for is charitable bequests. Now, ladies and gents, this is if you have a will and you want to leave um, X amount of money for any public charity organization. If you leave money behind for charity purposes, so saying we don't want to tax you on that money. That is tax free money. So if you leave 100,000 Rand to this children's fund for argument's sake, so as I was saying, we can minus that 100,000 Rand over there. We are not going to tax you on any money you leave for charity. Ladies and gents, leaving 100,000 Rand for your poor cousin does not count as charity. It's for a public organization recognized as a charitable organization. That is a charity contribution. So if, some, if you have an exam question, and obviously that means the person died test state, then you can only have something like this. And it says that the deceased leaves behind, let's say, 100K for this. I use the example of a children's fund. And you know that 100K, we're going to minus under allow reductions by estate duty. Right? I think it makes sense that any charitable contribution should not be taxed. Eh? I think that makes perfect sense. The third one is, is interesting for me, and this is where you're actually going to learn quite a bit about how to structure your estate. Look what I say here. Life policy, where surviving spouse is the named beneficiary. Now, let's talk about this. What did we learn about life policies you take out over your life that has a named beneficiary? We learned it's not your asset because it gets paid to that person, the beneficiary. However, for tax purposes, it's regarded as your asset, right? But look what they put by allowable deductions. They say if you took out a life policy over your life and the named beneficiary happens to be your surviving spouse or your spouse, you can minus it over there. So what are they actually saying? They are saying that if the beneficiary to your life policy is your spouse, we're not going to hurt you on tax. If it is someone else other than your spouse, we're going to hurt you. Let's make sense of it. I take out a life policy that says when I die, 5 million rand must be paid to my wife. Okay, let's do estate duty. When you get to deem property, do you agree that's a life policy I took out? And you agree my wife is the name beneficiary. So I need to plus it. I need to plus that 5 million rand under deem property. Okay. When you do your allowable deductions... You agree that it says any life policy that I take out with a name beneficiary is my spouse, you can minus it. So you agree I now get to minus that 5 million rand by allowable deductions. So do you see I plus the 5 million and I went, then went and minus the 5 million. Now I know you're thinking to yourself, but then why add it? I mean, the one writes the other off. Remember what I told you earlier about full disclosure? You have to always show full disclosure. So I plus the 5 million, I then minus the 5 million. So it means what? Do I pay tax on that life policy? No, I don't. It's neutral. It's zero, right? But let me give you a different scenario. I take out a life policy that says, when I die, 5 million rand must be paid to my child. So when I do my deemed property, you agree that's a life policy with a named beneficiary? Yeah, so I'm going to plus my 5 million. When I go to allowable deductions, that name beneficiary being my child, is my child my surviving spouse? No. So do I get to minus that 5 million over there? I do not. So what are they telling you? You got hurt on tax because you took out a life policy and your spouse was not the beneficiary. That's the way it works. So what do I learn from this? I learned you can actually take this situation 
and try and make it work for you. I mean, if, if you think of your estate, and let's say you are married and you have a kid or kids, for argument's sake, you know, you kind of want to leave something probably for everyone. You know, and, and you might think you don't have enough assets to really leave something for everyone. So let's rather take out a life policy um, as well. So say everyone has a little bit extra, perhaps. What it teaches me is rather leave your assets for your kids and then take out a life policy for your spouse instead of the other way around. Imagine you leave, you left your assets for your spouse, but took out a life policy for your kids. Do you see how you're just messing yourself up on tax over there? Because you're going to be taxed on it. Where if you left it for your spouse, you're not going to be taxed on it because it would have got plus and minus. Give you a simple example. I remember a, a client I had years ago, very, very wealthy. I'm talking like silly wealthy. And uh, he had a lot of farmlands and he had two daughters and a spouse. And let's say plus minus, you know, everything was valued at about 60 million for argument's sake. Um, he didn't want to leave the things or his farming implements and stuff for his daughters because he was saying they had no interest in farming. So what was the point? So what he did is he left his estate for his spouse and then he took out two life policies for each of his daughters. I think something like, 15 million each for each daughter. Right. We looked at his estate and the problem was his property was already 60 million. Okay. So that's a problem. But his deemed property was already 30 million because of the two life policies in his daughters. And we couldn't minus that by allowable deductions. So this man would have been taxed on 90 million. Okay. Minus whatever allowable deductions they had. And then you would have minus a three and a half million rebate. It was crazy how much tax he was going to pay. He was about half of his estate was going to go to SARS. Literally half of his estate. So we explained that and we adjusted the will. What we did is we said, let's do it this way. Why don't you leave 30 million life policy to your spouse? Those two life policies you have for your kids are 15 million each. Cancel your kids from the life policy. Make your spouse the beneficiary. So it'll be 30 million your spouse will get. Because remember, we're going to plus that 30 million and minus it. So it's neutral. It's a write-off. There's no tax on that. Then for your 60 million assets, um, why did we just put a clause in the will that everything should be sold and the money divided amongst your kids? Is that not another possibility? And we actually worked it out that way. We ended up saving him 30 million rand on tax just by changing that. And that's what they speak about with understanding estate duty. Estate planning is estate duty. If you know estate duty, you can do estate planning for someone. That one change saved him 30 million rand. Didn't save him the money, it saved his beneficiaries that money. They would have lost 30 million rand. He thought he was leaving his wife 60 million rands worth of assets on the farm. She would have only got 20 million or 30 million because the rest SARS would have taken. He didn't even realize that. Okay. So it makes you think, it makes you wonder, if you think about life policies and leaving assets for persons, rather leave a life policy for the spouse and the assets for the kids. I mean, sometimes you just don't have, you don't have enough assets and, and you take out life policies for the kids. And I mean, nothing wrong with that. You want to leave them something, but understand that there is a consequence from a tax perspective if you leave it for the kids and no consequence from a tax perspective if you leave it for the spouse. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you just another thing to think about. You know, I also believe that from a practical viewpoint, it's better to leave your spouse a life policy than an asset. And let me explain why I say that. Not just the tax implications, I've covered that already. But from a life perspective, what, I've, what you'll figure out and what you'll see, and I think it's already come to fruition over here, is... Winding up a deceased estate can take time, right? It, it can take time. I mean, I've, I've told you it can take anything from, let's say, nine months to 10 years if you're very unlucky. But the idea is to try to get it done in a year. Okay, but it can take time. So it's going to take a time for those assets to pass over to your beneficiaries. It's fine if those beneficiaries are your kids. But a lot of times, you and your spouse rely on each other financially. 
you know, you support each other. And if you take away the one salary, it hurts the household, right? Can your spouse sit and wait for years for your estate to pay out to get that financial support that your spouse is now lacking? Probably not. How long does it take a life policy to pay out? Three months plus minus? So if you take out a life policy for your spouse, you would give them a shorter period of time to wait before they receive financial relief as well. I'm just giving you food for thought over here. And the more food for thought you have, the better you can sit and talk to this about your clients as well. So I think not just from a tax perspective, but from a, a, a real life perspective, a financial position perspective in life, the quicker your spouse can get their money when you pass away, the better off they are. And remember what I even told you at the beginning of the week, you know, if your spouse is okay and you have minor kids, your kids will be okay. You know, that whole concept. So I really do believe that life policies in favor of your spouse has huge benefits instead of assets in favor for your spouse. Just something to think about, but I've obviously expanded now a bit more than I probably needed to. But from an estate duty perspective, as long as we understand, if the beneficiary was your spouse, you plus it and you minus it. If the beneficiary was someone else who was not your spouse, you just plus it by deemed property, you did not get to minus it by allowable deductions. Right. The next allowable deduction I have here is accrual paid. Okay, ladies and gents, back to our discussion of deemed property. What did we have there as our second deemed property? We had accrual received. And I explained the whole accrual situation to all of you. And I said, you know, what happens is um, when you pass away, accrual kicks in. And then I said that if the surviving spouse owes your deceased estate money, it's deemed property, hey? Because you are now getting this money, even though you passed away, the deceased estate is getting it, and you're going to be taxed on it. But the opposite is also true, hey? It could also happen that your deceased estate owes the surviving spouse accrual. Perhaps you were financially stronger than your spouse during your marriage. Now, the, the difference must be paid over to your spouse now, hey? Right. The size is saying... If you now, I think I used the example of the spouse owing the deceased estate a million rand, and we said that was deemed property because of accrual. But let's say the deceased estate owes the surviving spouse a million rand because of the accrual system. Now we have to take a million rand out of the deceased estate and pay it to our surviving spouse. Eh? Well, the executor must obviously do that. It makes sense that we can't be taxed on that million rand anymore, hey? Eh? Because it's not ours anymore. We had to give it to our spouse. I mean, if we're getting taxed, when our spouse pays us, then surely if we're paying our tax, our spouse money, we should not be taxed on that. Eh? The opposite is also true. So if you've got an accrual situation, and the situation is the deceased estate must pay the surviving spouse money because of the accrual, whatever you pay your spouse, you can minus over there. And it makes logical sense. If receiving accrual is a deep property, then paying accrual must be an allowable deduction. Right. There is one more allowable deduction, ladies and gents. I've generalized it, but I'll be more specific now. It's, I say uh, anything that goes to a surviving spouse as a result of the deceased's death. Okay. Ladies and gents, I'm referring to marriage here. Okay. Um, specifically, now we've seen the three marriage regimes we've really focused on was the marriage regime out of community of property, without the accrual or with the accrual, and then thirdly, the marriage in community of property. Now, we know if you married out of community of property, straight, you know, without the accrual, there's no marital impact, none whatsoever. If you are married out of community of property with the accrual system, we know for tax purposes there may be an impact. If the deceased owes the survivor money, it's an allowable deduction. If the survivor owes the deceased money, it was a deemed property. What about marriages in community of property? We haven't discussed that one yet by estate duty. Just having a sip of water, give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> so, if me and you are married in community of property, Remember, it's, we have one estate. Eh? 
not half an estate. We have one estate. We are regarded as one person, me and you. We married in community of property. So if we had a, if, if I die and there's a house valued at 2 million rand, I don't put 1 million rand by my assets in the liquidation account and claim that it's only because I own half that why I'm putting a million. No, there's one estate. You put the full value of everything. If you're married in community of property, you still put the full value of everything. You don't half it because you married in. No, you put the full amounts down. Always, if you were wondering. But Saul is saying, but hold on. If you are married in community of property and we're sitting with all these figures, what is actually going to happen? You are only taking half, right? And your spouse is taking the other half. So can SARS tax you on the full value of your deceased estate? No, they cannot. They can only tax you on half because the other half is your spouse. When he or she dies, they can tax your spouse on the other half. But you, they can't. It'll be unfair. Imagine... I mean, imagine they tax you personally on the whole estate, but your spouse is taking half and your spouse is still alive. It makes zero sense, right? So if you are married in community of property, half of your estate must be minus by allowable deductions because SARS is not allowed to tax you on half of your estate because the other half is your spouse's. You only own half. So I'm sure that makes sense. So how do we calculate your half share? Now, remember, this is not your real life half share. This is tax purposes half share. I'm going to give you a simple, very, very easy formula that you can write down. How do you calculate your spouse's half share? Now, remember, ladies and gents, this is only if you get an exam question where the deceased was married in community of property. We understand that half of that estate is our spouse's. We know we haven't given half of the estate away yet. We're going to sort that out in the distribution account. What we're doing here, remember what I told you? You are literally not giving anyone anything. You are just following a formula to see how much you owe SARS. So don't think this is how much your spouse is going to get. We'll see in the distribution account how much the spouse is going to get. It's simply just a formula. So let's say you're in an exam and you have an exam question that says the spouse was married in community, the deceased was married in community of property. We know straight away for tax purposes, we need to minus our spouse's half share because we cannot be taxed on the full value of the estate. It is obviously not fair. So the question is, how do you calculate your spouse's half share? I'm going to give you the formula, which is very easy, short as well, and then I'm going to explain it to you afterwards. The formula works as follows. Property. Minus liabilities. Say it again. Property minus liabilities. That's going to give you an answer. So you can write there. Property minus liabilities equals question mark. Whatever that answer is. That answer divide by two. So property minus liabilities. Get an answer. You take that answer and you divide it by two. That's your spouse's half share. So where do I get this information from? So what's the first thing I said? I said property, right? Where did you see the term property? I saw it on page six, eh? Remember our first heading under the state duty was property, eh? Not deemed property, just property. The, the, the formula does not say property and deemed property. The formula says to calculate your spouse's half share, it's property minus liabilities. The only place ever in your l and account that you see the term property is in your estate duty account. You see the heading property on page six. Underneath it, we said total assets minus 30% of farming undertaking minus difference in private shares. That gave us an answer. Hey? That answer there, your property answer there from your estate duty that you see on page six. I'm going to say again because people are going to ask me. It is not your deemed property. It is your property from your estate duty. That answer you got. Minus liabilities. Ladies and gents, where did we find our liabilities? We found it on page five under total liabilities. 
We even wrote it down on page six under estate duty under allowable deductions, where we have the heading liabilities. That so your total liabilities from your liquidation account. So your property, let's say your property was for argument's sake three million, and let's say your liabilities was one million. So it'll be three million minus one million. That equals two million. Take the two million divided by two is one million. That will be your spouse's half share for argument's sake. Okay. So there's the formula for how to calculate your spouse's half share. But I want everything to make sense. And I'm going to recap it now no, as well in case we miss something. All right. So don't stress about that. That is the allowable deductions that I want you to look out for. Obviously, you're going to add all of these allowable deductions up and it's going to give you an answer. Eh? Now, the rest of the sum is easy as can be. What's the next thing we have to do? We have to minus the section 4A primary rebate. Look what I've done there. I said less 4A primary rebate and I wrote there three and a half million. Ladies and gents, don't ask me where do you get the three and a half million from? I don't get it from anywhere. It's gazetted. It's by law, minus three and a half million. It changes over time. Um, you know, I remember when I started, it wasn't three and a half million. I remember if you look at the notes, at a stage it was 2.3 million, and then it increased to 3 million, and then it went to three and a half million. But I know it's been on three and a half million for quite a long time now. It's been a good couple of years, um, lots of years actually, um, that it's been set on three and a half million. It hasn't increased. Um, for a while and I'm actually not happy about that because if you look at inflation and everything around it that three and a half million should have increased by quite a lot already but is what it is point is that's just part of the formula you now minus three and a half million okay now go back to page six go back to the start of your sum by property I want us to see this to see the picture so we started off with property. We, we did our whole thing there. We got our answer for property, right? Then we did our deemed property, but we said plus deemed property. Eh? So we took our property answer. We plus our deemed property to it. You can see it's in the positive column anyways. And then we said minus your allowable deductions. You can see it's in the negative column. And then we said minus three and a half million, which is the primary rebate. Ladies and gents, property plus deemed property minus allow deductions minus three and a half million is going to give you an answer. That answer we call our dutable amount equals dutable amount. Remember I told you at the beginning that answer is either going to be positive or it's going to be negative. If it's negative, we just write no. That means we don't owe SARS anything. If it's positive, it means we're going to owe SARS money. Does it make sense if I tell you the only way for that to be positive is if your property and deemed property is high, very high, and your allowable deductions is low? Then there's a chance because remember, you still got to, you still always have to minus a three and a half million. I mean, if your property is three million and your deemed property is, is one million, now we have four million, right? Now we can minus allowable deductions. Let's say our allowable deductions is one million. So 4 million minus 1 million is 3 million. Now we have to minus 3.5 million rebate. 3 million minus 3.5 million is negative 500,000 rand. Great, we don't owe SARS anything. Our estate duty is nil. So you, you've got to be quite wealthy. Your property and name property has to be quite high before you're going to get a positive answer over there. So let's say you got a positive answer. Let's say your dutable amount was 100,000 rand. Then you move over to the last step. The last step is 20% of your dutable amount equals estate duty. Estate duty is what we have to pay SARS. So if our dutable amount was 100K, what's 20% of 100K? It is 20,000 Rand, right? So our estate duty is 20K. That means we owe SARS 20,000 Rand for argument's sake. Now, to recap, I just wanted to tell you how I found it easiest to learn this uh, estate duty account. I mean, obviously, you can do as you please. But I think when you start off with the estate duty, when you start learning it, it could be a bit overwhelming to look at the account as a whole. Okay, so 
I think it's better to divide the account up and to study portions separately from each other. Because the reality is, you started with property. Yeah, you've got to study. You've got to study. Okay, Carl, remember property is your total assets. You take that from a liquidation account. You could potentially do two things to it. You could, if the, the, does the question say the person owned a farm? Okay, no, it doesn't. Okay, leave it. Okay, yes, it does say. How much was that farm worth? 30% of the value of the farm, I can mine this. Great. Does the question speak of shares in a private company? Okay, yes, it does. Was the share sold for more than what it was valued at? Yes. Okay, minus the difference. Was the share sold for less than what it was valued at? Okay, plus the difference. That's property, done and dusted. I get my answer. I got total asset minus farming undertaking minus difference in private company shares equals my property. Forget about your property. Forget about it. You've done it. Then you go plus Dean property and you think to yourself, okay, what was Dean property? What did Carl say? It was donations into the deceased estate. Have a look if you see anything like that. Accrual received. Was there a marriage with the accrual system? No, there wasn't. Forget about it. Life policies over the deceased life with the name beneficiary. Did I see something like that over the exam? I did. Okay, great. Add it. There's your deemed property. Add it all together. Now I have my deemed property. Okay, forget about it. Forget about your deemed property now. Next heading, allowable deductions. What were the five things we learned as allowable deductions? This is great. Allowable deductions are things we can minus. Hey? Your total liabilities. Okay, I take that from the liquidation account. Secondly, was there any charitable bequest? Let me see in the exam question. Was there a will? Okay, what, I see there was a will. Did they, denote, did they donate any money to charity? Ah, oh, they did. Okay, I can minus it. Next one. The life policies we spoke about will be plus by the deemed property where there was a named beneficiary. Was that named beneficiary the spouse of the surviving spouse, of the deceased? No, it wasn't. Okay, there's nothing I can minus there. Or oh, hold on. Yes. The beneficiary to that life policy was the deceased spouse. Great, I get to minus it over there as well. Next one. Was there an accrual marriage? Uh, out of community property with accrual? No, there wasn't. But if there was, did the deceased owe the survivor any money? If they did, we get to minus it over there. Lastly, was there a marriage in COP? No, there wasn't. Forget about it. Or if there was, okay, I learned the formula. Property minus liabilities equals an answer. Take that answer divided by two for SARS purposes, not for real life, but for SARS purposes. That is what I get to deduct. That's what SARS regards as my spouse's half share. Cool. Done with it. Okay, I've finished my allowable, allowable deductions. I added all up. Move on to the next step. I go minus section 4A primary rebate, three and a half million. Literally, ladies and gentlemen, literally a free mark in the exam. There's a lot of free marks in estate duty, actually. Some of the stuff might be complicated, but there's a lot of really straightforward copy-paste things as well. This is a free mark, so don't leave it out in the exam. You're throwing a mark away. So I write there, minus three and a half million. Now, for the first time, do I look at my sum as a whole? That's the easiest way. Now I go, okay, I punch in my calculator. How much was my property figure? Punch it in. And I see how much was my deemed property figure. Okay, plus that deemed property figure. Right. How much was my allowable deduction figure? Okay, minus that allowable deduction figure. And then lastly, minus three and a half million. What does my calculator give me? Gives me a negative answer. Great, my estate duty is null. No issues. Gives me a positive answer. Okay, I write the positive answer down by estate duty. What's 20% of that positive answer? That gives me my estate duty. That is how much I owe SARS, right? What do I do with this estate duty amount, ladies and gents? Remember, you're going to get an answer on page seven, which is your estate duty. You're going to take this figure. Remember, you've got to take it back to your liquidation account. Eh? So you're going to go back to page, what's, what was it? Was page five. <clears throat> go back to page five. <clears throat> Well, I just grab some more water quickly. <clears throat> right. We're going to go and put that estate duty amount 
there next to estate duty in our liquidation account. Right? Remember, we left it open there underneath total liabilities. We left our estate duty open. We're going to go put the figure in there. If we didn't owe SARS any money, then we're going to go write nil. We'll just write the NIL. Remember, you can never put a zero in the l and account. If the answer is zero, you write nil. A N I L. Just remember that. We'll put it down. Or if it was a positive answer, we'll put it down. Now, for the first time, we can complete the liquidation account. Because now we can punch in our calculator total assets, that figure we got at the, at the bottom of page four, minus total liabilities, which we have on page five, minus estate duty, which we have on page five, equals balance available for distribution. Now we have the net value of the deceased estate, ladies and gentlemen, which was our aim, hey? Because the net value, that balance available for distribution, that is the amount that our beneficiaries are looking at. If you were married and you owe your spouse money because of the marriage, they're going to take from that figure. If you have legatees, they're going to take from that figure. Obviously, everyone has heirs, whether you die testate or intestate, they're going to take from that figure. That's the amount that's going to get carried over into the distribution account. But these are the two main accounts, ladies and gents. You are going to be tested on an exam. You will see tomorrow the other three accounts is going to take us super quick to go through. Um, it's really not too complicated. And again, ladies and gents, the way you feel about it now will change during the course of tomorrow evening. So tomorrow evening, we'll go through an example together as well. I mean, a lot of you would have probably already read through that example that I've sent you. And you might have a bit of an edge over everyone else who has not read through it. And that, that's, the, that's the honest truth. And a lot of things would make a lot more sense already. Some of you who haven't looked at it at all, well, you, you obviously have to wait till tomorrow night for that to then start to make a bit more sense. But I don't expect you to look at what I've done now and be able to do this. That, that's not the point. If this is the first time you're ever seeing this in your life, it's obviously going to be overwhelming. But what I do want is an understanding of what we're trying to achieve, the purpose of what we're trying to do, so that tomorrow night when we use figures, it makes a bit more sense. You might leave and think, yes, I don't know, this l &D looks very, very tough for me. Hey, That's fine. As long as you are in a position that you can go and study it because you understand what you are studying now. That's the main aim behind it. Once you understand it, you are on your way. It, it's when you don't understand it that it becomes more difficult to study it. That's the whole concept behind it. So you can see these two accounts were very dependent on each other. I mean, we used, we used our total asset and total liability figure from the liquidation account to complete our estate duty account. Eh? I mean, total assets fall under property and total liabilities fall under um, allowable deductions. Right. Ladies and gents, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Um, I know if I open the floor for questions now, there's only going to be two or three questions, and then and then it's going to be over. Then it's half past eight. So I would rather do questions tomorrow and do less talking tomorrow and more questions if that makes sense. You know. So I'm thinking, let's look at the third account because it's going to take us super quick. Let's look at the third account that we, we have that advantage over tomorrow. And then we only have two accounts to look at. It will take us 20 minutes. And then we can do, you know, easily an hour session of questions um, tomorrow based on this l &D. And thereafter, we can use the second part of the lecture after the break to go through the exam question together. I think that might be the best way. I know there would be a lot of questions probably on what we've done so far. But like I said, just keep your note on it. It doesn't make sense to open questions now with only 14 minutes left in the lecture. I'd rather have a full hour just on questions so I can get to as much as possible. So let's look at our third account. Then tomorrow we only have the other two accounts and we can do a long question session. Okay. The third account we find on page eight, the distribution account. Well, I told you guys that it's up to you. You know, you can see that the liquidation account must be first. The estate duty account must be second. But 
whether you do your recapitulation account next or your distribution account next, that's completely your choice, right? So it's a no specific order. I'm just jumping into the distribution account next. Now, remember what we learned. We learned the distribution account, the people that are interested in this account is our beneficiaries, hey? Because this is where you take what's left, your balance available for distribution from your liquidation account, that net value. You carry it forward into this account and you give it away in order of ranking. Now, look at the columns first. Again, very similar to my estate duty account. I use the first column to write. The next column is my negative column and the last column is my positive column. Now, we're not really minusing and plusing in this account. However, I am carrying a figure forward into the account. And from that figure, I'm giving money away. I'm giving money in terms of marriage away. I'm giving money to legatees away. I'm giving money to heirs away. Hey. So every time I give something to them, I put it in the negative column. Why? Because it's obviously minusing from my figure. Okay. So if you have a look here, you see I started off by saying balance available for distribution brought forward. For those who missed it yesterday, you take that figure straight from page five. Bottom of page five, bottom of the liquidation account, that balance available for distribution, which was assets minus liabilities minus estate duty, gave us balance available for distribution. That figure you're going to carry forward into your distribution account, which we see on page eight. You're going to put it in the positive column. All right. Let's fabricate scenarios. Let's fabricate figures to make life easier. Let's say the exam question said we were married in community of property. Just for argument's sake. All right. Let's fabricate how much our balance was that we carried forward. Let's just make it easy. Let's say the balance was 2 million rand. Okay. So after we paid SARS and we paid the creditors, we had 2 million rand that we have left. That's our balance left for distribution. That's what we've carried now into the distribution account. Now we've got to give it away in order of ranking. Remember, I spoke to you about the ranking. I'll say it one more time. Give it away in ranking. Marriage. They go first. Next is legacies. Lastly is heirs. All right. So let's say you were married in community of property to Y, for argument's sake. You agree with me that Y is entitled to half of your estate, hey? Because of the marriage in community of property. I mean, if we were married completely out of community of property, I would skip, I would skip it because the, my spouse doesn't have a claim. Hey? Or if I was single. I wouldn't worry about giving anything to my spouse. I would skip that step because there's no one to give it to. But if there was a marriage in COP, we know my spouse is entitled to half, right? So if I carry 2 million rand down, how much would I give my surviving spouse? Half, right? How much is half of 2 million? It is 1 million rand. So you see I write here two surviving spouse. If I was married in COP and I carried 2 million down, it must mean I must give my surviving spouse 1 million rand, half of that figure. Hey. Now, every time you give something away, you just calculate how much you have left. Okay, that's just to make life easier for you. If I had 2 million and I gave my spouse 1 million, how much do I have left? I have 1 million rand left. So my new balance available for distribution is 1 million rand. That's, how much of, that's what I have left after I've sorted my spouse out. Who's next in the ranking? Legatees, hey? So you see I write here two legatees. Now, ladies and gents, I mean, we're fabricating things, hey? If I have a million rand left, let's say we had one legatee. I think I said earlier that we gave um, 100,000 rand to that children's fund, if you recall. You would agree that's a legatee, hey? I mean, the children's fund must specifically get 100K. That would make them a legatee. So they rank next in line. So... I give the children's fund then as a legatee 100,000 rand. And again, please, ladies and gents, I'm purely fabricating all of these scenarios. We'll look at a real question tomorrow, but it's just to help the understanding of how to draft it. That's why I fabricate these things. Okay. So if I had a million rand and I gave the children's fund half, no, I gave them 100,000 rand. What is my new balance for distribution? Well, the million minus 100,000 is 900,000 rand. Okay, cool. I've sorted my legatees out. 
I've sorted my marriage out. I've sorted my legacies out. I now have 900K left. Every time I sort someone out, I count how much I have left. Okay, who is lost? Lost is the heirs, right? To the heirs. What are we going to say? We're going to say that we had a will and we had two heirs. Our heirs were our two children. We left to our two children, A and B. We nominated them as the heirs in our will. Again, purely fabricating it. What's the rules? Heirs share in what is left. Hey, if I have 900,000 Rand left and I have two heirs being A and B, they must now share the 900,000 Rand, right? That'll mean how much does A get? A gets 450,000. And then B gets the other 450,000. The point is, the heirs take in what's left. If I have 10 Rand left and I have two heirs, it means each one takes five Rand. If I have 20 million left and I have two heirs, it means each one takes 10 million Rand. The heirs take what's left. So you see when you're done giving away to the heirs, look what your last balance is. Balance available for distribution? No. You must obviously finish with a no balance because you give away to your spouse their marital claim. You give your legatees whatever they're entitled to according to your will. What is left, you give everything what's left away to your heirs. They share in what's left. That is your distribution account, ladies and gents. It is not overly complicated or a lot quicker, a lot easier. You're just giving everything away in ranking. I mean, uh, just in case you were wondering, I mean, <clears throat> let's take the same scenario, but let's say you were married, let's say you die intestate. For those who are wondering, I mean, it's a completely different scenario. How would we deal with it? Let's keep the facts the same. Let's say we carry 2 million Rand into the distribution account. We were married in community of property and we had two kids. Okay. Obviously, you cannot have a legatee if you die intestate. Eh? You can only have a legatee if you die testate with a will. How would we deal with that scenario? Okay. We sort marriage out. Eh? If we had 2 million, we'd have to give our spouse 1 million if we were married in community of property. Great. So our new balance would now be 1 million. So that doesn't change anything. Obviously, if we died intestate, there would not have been any legatees. Legatees are people who get something specific. That, that can only come from a will. Eh? So that, that would be skipped. We then move over to our heirs. Hey? Heirs share in what's left. Now remember, we have a million rand left. Now what does the fact say? We have a spouse and we have two kids. What does intestate law say? That's rule one. Hey? Take the million rand, divide it between your spouse and kids. I go a million divided between my spouse and two kids. So that's a million divided by three. Hey? That will give you like 333,000 rand. Something like that. And you say is 333,000 greater or lesser than 250K? It's greater. What does the rule say? If it's more than 250K, give everyone their equal share. So I'll go give 333,000 to my spouse, 333K to child A, 333K to child B. So all I'm saying is it doesn't matter what they ask you in the exam, whether they give you a test date law or interstate law question. If it's test date, it's obviously easier because the exam question will tell you who must get what. Hey? If it's intestate, don't panic. We learned the rules. Just follow your rules. It doesn't change anything. I mean, let's say I had, uh, let's say I had 600,000 Rand from my liquidation account that I carried forward. So my balance available for distribution was 600K. I carried that forward yeah, into my distribution account. Let's say I gave half to my spouse. It means I have 300K left, right? Now I want to divide the 300K to my heirs. So I go, all right, I have a spouse and two kids. What's 300,000 divided between the three of them? 100K each. May I do that? No, red flag. Spouse must get the greater of an equal share or 250K. So I go and give my spouse another 250K. And then my, my two kids share in the remaining 50K, 25K each. So apply your interstate law rules if they ask you interstate question. I've seen in the past when someone gets an interstate law uh, scenario for an l &D, they panic and they don't know what to do. And, and I, I, I can't grasp why. We've learned the rules on Monday. So if you get interstate law question, where, where, is, where do you need to follow interstate law if you get an interstate law l &D?
in your distribution account. Hey? Remember your distribution account under the heading heirs is where you will need to apply your intestate law. If you get a will in the exam, if it's testate, where are you going to apply the will? In your distribution account under the heading heirs or under the heading legatees as well. That's the only time it makes an impact because that's where you give something away in terms of the will or in terms of the laws of interstate succession. So you don't have to panic about that if you get an interstate law question. Just follow your rules that we learned. But as you can see, and as promised, your distribution account considerably easier hey, than the other accounts. I mean, really, the liquidation account, I believe, is quite easy as long as you study those couple things I told you. It's free marks there. Your estate duty account, I admit, it could be a bit of a challenge, um, ladies and gents. But I've tried to simplify it as far as I can. At least we've covered three accounts. We only have two more accounts. Like I said, it's going to take us 20 minutes. So the game plan is as follows. We start 5.30 tomorrow. I'll finish those last two accounts with you. All right? Let's say we're done by 10 to 6 for argument's sake. We'll open the floor up for questions till 10 to 7. We break. 10 to 7 to 7 o'clock, we take our 10 minute, 10 minute break. 7 o'clock, we come back and we open the exam question and the memo and we go through it together. That would be the best way possibly of dealing with it. Ladies and gents, I know it's been um, a long session. Trust me, it's been long for me as well. But uh, we, we got through those three and we, we, we did the most difficult part of the week tonight. Right? It will start to get better tomorrow. Um, please remember whatever questions you have. I'm going to open the floor tomorrow. Make a note of your questions. You will get the opportunity to ask it to me then. All right, ladies and gents, enjoy the rest of your evening. Catch you guys, half past five tomorrow. Bye.